Okay, folks, we are live. Karate Kid. What's up, Sergeant Rich? May God bless you. May the triune God grant you perfect health, long life. Bless your family, and I pray that for every one of you in Jesus' name. I'm proud of you. 10 miles, I pray in Jesus' name I catch up to you. I need to do 10 miles every day as well to keep my weight down and get my heart fit in Jesus' name. May you give us that grace and perfect self-discipline. What's up, Mickey? What's up, buddy? Hey, Mickey, you're so fine. You're so fine. You blow my mind. Hey, Mickey. Oh, Mickey, what a pity you don't understand. You take me by the heart when you take me by guys like you, Mickey. Well, pray for me, folks. Today is my daughter's birthday, and I had a cheat day, and boy, I went overboard. I do appreciate your prayers that God gave me perfect self-control, self-discipline, that even on those days, I cut back drastically and not let it get out of hand by the power of the Holy Spirit. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Oh, Mickey, what a pity you don't understand. Now, folks, do me a favor. We have Protestant believer here. He's a blessing. He posts verses for me when necessary, but share the link on your social media platforms. Invite more folks. If we have time, I'll open up the Q&A because where I'm at here in Florida, thanks to my brother in the Lord Jesus, who's been a gracious host. May the Lord bless him. It was raining real badly. It looks like it's clearing up. If it, if it does so, I'll probably go walking and we'll see. But anyway, hopefully the connection stays strong. Thank you, Sergeant Gritch. May the Lord Jesus bless your family. If you have children, bless all your children. As I pray, he blesses mine, my oldest and my youngest. Right? Saying, bless you and your family too. Amen. In fact, uh, I'll read what my youngest sent me because I sent that video to her and her older sister for their birthday. And not only is it my firstborn's birthday, she turned 12. May the Lord Jesus allow me to see them become godly women who won't need me anymore. And then may I leave this world before anything happens to them. As I said in the previous session, <clears throat> eight years ago, March 12, 2014, when my firstborn turned four years of age, the Lord Jesus took my blessed mother into his glorious heavenly presence. My mother, Helen, Helen Jassim, entered the presence of the Lord Jesus, which I, I believe that's what happened because I know Jesus is alive. He's not dead. And we who die in Christ remain alive, even though we're in another dimension, a spiritual dimension. Our bodies return to dust, awaiting Jesus to descend physically to resurrect our physical bodies. So on that day, my mother left. It was a Wednesday, March 12, 2014, when my firstborn turned four years old. And she loved my firstborn. And she loved my youngest, but she didn't see my youngest as much because my mom was really sick and ill. So today on Facebook, I saw my older brother post something about our mother. She's with Jesus. We know that because Christ said, our Lord said, I am the resurrection and the life. <clears throat> he who believes in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And he who believes and lives shall never die. Do you believe this? And I pray by the power of the Holy Spirit that he destroys all our fears, our doubts and unbelief and grant us the gifts of perfect faith, faithfulness in Jesus, trust, to perfectly trust in Jesus, to perfectly cling and cleave to Jesus, and to perfectly hope in Jesus, and have no doubt he's alive, he is risen, and may the Lord Jesus, by his spirit, keep us covered, washed, purified, cleansed by his blood. And I pray he does that for our loved ones. I pray that he does it for my daughters, their mother, in Jesus' name. Seal us by his Holy Spirit, flood us in his love to never betray or deny or blaspheme or disown or doubt Jesus Christ, our Lord. May the Lord Jesus increase in all of us, increase in our loved ones, increase in my daughters, more of Jesus, less of us. Sit and throne upon our hearts, the hearts of our loved ones, the hearts of my daughters, even their mother. She needs Jesus. We need Jesus. We were created for Jesus. And may the Lord Jesus save us from our sinful lusts, sinful passions, our weaknesses, destroy, crucify our flesh, our pride, our arrogance, our ego. Save us from Satan to hate Satan with perfect hatred and resist him with perfect resistance and plead the blood of Jesus Christ against him and submit to the Lord Jesus Christ with perfect submission and trust in the Holy Spirit perfectly in Jesus' name. And may the Lord Jesus 
feed us his holy flesh and give us his blood and do that for our loved ones. Do that for my angels, my daughters, because his flesh is real food and his blood is real drink. And by the flesh of Jesus Christ, the blood of Jesus Christ, we are saved. We are protected. We are nourished and fed. <clears throat> we are made whole. We are healed. It is our food, our medicine and our salvation against the world, against Satan, against our own sinfulness in Jesus name. Please, son of God, you are the father's heart, the eternal love of the spirit. Strengthen my throat with perfect health and vigor. Anoint my mouth, Lord Jesus, by your spirit to speak clearly and accurately without error, without confusion, without stammering. And enable me by the gifts you've given me to perfect these gifts for your glory, Lord Jesus, not for the praise of men, to never prostitute ourselves for fame or fortune. And Lord Jesus, help me recall the scriptures perfectly and pack them perfectly and all the facts perfectly. Save me from error and stammering and illuminate the hearts and minds of your servants, Lord Jesus, that your spirit will use me to bless them and strengthen them. Teach us how to pray to you, how to sing to you, how to love you, how to obey you, how to fear you and live for you and glorify and preach your gospel for your glory, Lord Jesus. And please, Lord, bless the audio and visual qualities and beatify us with your beauty, Lord Jesus, your holiness, righteousness. And please do not allow us to betray you and fall into any scandals. Please do not give me what I deserve, Lord Jesus. Have mercy. Even on those, Lord Jesus, that we disagree with because of the path they've chosen. Take over the session. Take over the ministry. Take over our lives. Take over the lives of our loved ones. My daughters, we belong to you, Lord Jesus. Own us fully for your glory, for the glory of Abba, Father. By the power of the Spirit, in Jesus' name we pray. Out of our Father, Son, and Spirit. So my brother had left the post about my mom. I want to read it to you guys because I want to show you something, how instinctively... Remember, God has written his law in our hearts, and we bear the image of God. Though it's been tainted by sin, it has not been effaced, right? <clears throat> so I just want to read this for you guys, because it tells you that even instinctively, the Lord Jesus has made known his way, his will, his gospel in our hearts, albeit we need the inspired revelation perfectly preserved in Scripture, to show us when our instincts are in line with God's word. And those are instincts from God to make us aware of his law and his existence. And when <clears throat> certain instincts are not from the Lord, but from our own sinfulness or Satan trying to deceive us. I want to read this for you guys. You ready? It's on Facebook. And we'll pray the Lord's Prayer in a minute. Okay, watch here. This one my brother put. I want to get it for you. One second, guys. Because this shows you something instinctively that we instinctively know because God is real. Physical death is not the end of us. And I'm going to share with you a story that a Jehovah Witness elder <laughs> communicated with me. And it was sad because the person that shared that story with them, they deceived into thinking that when you die, you cease to exist until or unless God recreates you. But I'm going to share it with you. And I, I'm going to try, uh, again, remember the details perfectly, but I'll give you the gist of it because I do remember the gist. Watch here. This is my brother on Facebook. And it was, uh, was kind of painful to read this, but be that as it may. Watch here. Be that as it may. Let me see. Hmm. I guess he's got a different Facebook page because I can't find it here. Hold on, brethren. I don't know how many Facebook pages he has. He posted something about our, our beloved mother. Here. Let's see here. Yeah, I gotta find it. One second, because I want to read it. It's important. Give me a second, brethren. And invite folks. Share the links on your social media platform. Invite folks and be prepared. When class begins, we need to focus. No distractions. It's a class setting. We treat it as a class, and you're not my students. We're all students of the Spirit. And I'm not trying to be arrogant, presume that I'm used of the Spirit, but that's my hope and trust that the Spirit will use me for the glory of Christ. Hold on, I want to read something because it's going to bear witness to something. Interesting. I can't find it now. Oh, yeah, here it is. 
This is, you know how Facebook shares memories? So this Facebook shared a memory from my brother. It says three years ago. So then it's been more than eight years. Hold on. So if my mother went to be at the Lord, March 12, 2014, it is eight years, right? Guys, I'm not too good in math. Can you help me with the math? So March 12, 2014, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22. Yeah, it's, it's been four years. Okay. Uh, eight years. Sorry. May the Lord save me from error and stammering confusion and forgetfulness. And please, Lord, bless the internet connection. This is what he writes. It's hard to see this, you know. It's been eight years. It feels like yesterday. Yesterday. Our love, our friend, our mom, every time our heart beats, we remember you until we see you again. Love you always, mom. See, it just breaks my heart, but it is what it is. Death is the way of the earth until Jesus comes. We're going to have to lose each other temporarily until we meet each other in the presence of Jesus or until he returns. But here, let me post and read it for you. It's been eight years. It feels like yesterday. Our love, our friend, our mom, every time our heart beats, we remember you until we see you again. Love you always, mom. You know, what does this bear witness to? What does this bear witness to? Does anyone see? This is instinctively, meaning God wrote this in our hearts as an instinctive witness. To what? Does anyone see what this bears witness to? Anyone have an idea? And you'll see this all across social media pages. When people remember a loved one who, who has passed away, irrespective of ethnicity or religious background, yep, intercession of the saints. Exactly, crisis king. Why would my brother and why would people talk to their dead relatives if they don't believe that their dead relatives are alive and conscious and God allows them to be aware of their words to their loved ones. You understand? Protestants do this all the time as well. Right? Protestants do this as well. They'll deny communion of saints, but then when remembering a loved one that's passed, they'll speak to that loved one, either in a post, right? Or they'll go to the grave and speak to that person, even though their soul is not in the grave, their soul has left their bodies and they're with the Lord. If they're believers, that's our hope. That's what we trust. We don't want to believe they're under God's wrath. So this in itself is an implicit witness that the belief that those who die in union with Christ physically, they're alive, deathless, glorified in his presence, awaiting the resurrection of their bodies. And that because they're alive, the spirit can make known to them that you're speaking to them and addressing them. You get it? Right there. So anytime you see a Protestant who denies communion saints doing this, ask him or her, why are you doing that? So pray for Mickey Efrata. He just told me. His mom died December 2021. Yeah, I know it's hard for you, brother. Physically, she died, but her spirit is alive. She's now deathless and pain-free. She's united to Christ where she sees the Lord visibly, the Father visibly, and those who've gone before her, and she awaits the resurrection of her body. So with that said, we're going to begin. We got a lot to talk about. If you're praying that the Lord will bless the stream, bless me with the health and the holiness I need to serve the Lord and serve you and bless you to illuminate you, and that the internet connection will stay strong in Jesus' name. So let's begin by just now doing the Lord's Prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, of the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the one, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory, both now and forever. 
unto ages of ages. In the name of the Father and of the Son of the Holy Spirit, in Jesus' name, amen. Now, let me again explain why I do the crucifix the way I do and why others do it differently. I've explained it in the past, but someone asked me in the comment section. Okay, you'll have some people that don't do it this way, but why do I do it this way? Pay attention. Notice three fingers united, and then you have two fingers. I learned this from my Orthodox brothers and sisters in Christ. Let me explain. Okay, let me explain. Notice here, three, right? That's the Trinity, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Two, hypostatic union, the two natures of Christ. So in the Orthodox, they use all five fingers in a meaningful fashion to point to the reality of the Godhead. Three, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Two, Jesus is the God-man. Two natures, hypostatic union. Three, hypo hypostases, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Okay. Now, some will do... Now, I'm not saying this is the only right way. I'm just telling you why I do it, because I learned it this way. Some will do the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, left to right. If you notice, I do it in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit, right to left. Now, why is that? So, what's the symbolism? Well, here. I do it right to left because... It signifies that the Son, who's at the right hand of the Father, sent the Holy Spirit into the world to bring those who are in darkness to Christ. So Jesus, who's at the right hand of the Father, sends the Spirit from the Father into the world to bring us out of darkness into his light. Okay. Now, others will do it left to right to complete the thought. Why did the Holy Spirit enter the world? To take you out of darkness and alienation from Christ and bring you into union with Christ who's at the right hand of the Father. Either way is valid. You get what I'm saying? So I do it right to left. The Lord Jesus at the right hand of the Father sends the Spirit from the Father to take us out of darkness. Now, if you do it, name the Father of the Son and the Holy Spirit left to right, then you're completing the thought of what I just said. Because when the Holy Spirit enters the world, he takes us out of our darkness, alienation from Christ, into the light of Christ, uniting us to Christ who's at the right hand of the Father. You get it? You see the point? So we're not going to split hairs and fight over this. You get my point? We're not going to split hairs and fight over this. You do it in accord with the custom and practice of your church. Orthodox, do it the way they do it. Catholic, do it the way they do it. But when we make it an issue where we fight and divide, now we're being petty and splitting hairs and we're becoming legalists, right? Like the Pharisees and Sadducees who strained out a gnat and swallowed a camel. Let's not do that. We have freedom in Christ. Freedom in those areas where God has not clearly stated what we should do, how we should do it, so we have a freedom to do it, provided we're doing it to glorify Christ, and we don't sin in condemnation of someone else. That's Romans 14. Not everything God has made black and white. Not everything God has made black and white. This is why Paul says that there are some things that are shades of gray, where God leaves open to multiple possibilities, multiple choices, where he hasn't made it black and white in order to give us room, wiggle room, freedom to choose one way over another and to wrestle and at the same time be gracious and courteous to those who do another way, a way different from ours that is not wrong and damnable, right? So keep that in mind. As the old saying goes, in essentials, unity, right? Non-essentials, right? And all things shared. I'm trying to say how it goes, man. I hope I recall it. In essentials, unity. Non-essentials, liberty. And all things charity. That's the same. Now, I've heard people attribute it to Augustine. I don't know. 
But it goes like this. One more time. Let me repeat it. As the Lord blesses the internet connection. Please, Abba, Father. Please, Lord Jesus, Son of God. Please, Holy Spirit. I thought St. Francis was kosher. What's going on? All right. So what happened to St. Francis? I thought he was kosher. Did he say something that made him haram? So then why did he get blocked? I saw, I saw he got blocked or something. Is full armor apologetics starting to hate on people who are not Armenian? Essentials, unity. Not essentials, liberty. And all things, charity. What was the question that he asked? What did he ask 10 times? What was it? Can you repeat it so we can begin? Okay, so he's hidden now? Okay, that's fine. What did he ask 10 times? I don't know why. What's wrong with him? Why is he asking 10 times so we can begin? Yeah, St. Francis. Oh, no, that's a, yeah, yeah, you. St. Francis, 1982. Oh, St. Francis, you want to know which came uh, church came first? Is that what you want to know? Are you asking to start division? Which church came first or which sign, cross of the came first? I don't know. Okay, I don't, I don't get it, guys. Let's focus because we're about to begin because there's a lot to cover. Anyway, let's begin. We're going to talk about a Mohammedan manifesting on DCCI's live stream last night or yesterday. And then we're going to talk about Hamza Yusuf's lies and misinformation and dishonesty. And then we're going to segue into the Quran confirming the crucifixion. Kaza, I'm about to block you because you won't stop about my ethnicity and nationality. Do you want my social security? You want to marry my sister or do you have a sister you want me to marry for you? Right? Stop asking about me. It's not about me because I'm going to block you. I know you want my poster so you can burn incense to my picture and worship at my picture. That's idolatry. I'm not interested in your sister. And if I did have a sister, if she was godly, I wouldn't send her your way. But if she was a Jezebel, I would do all I can to marry you. Okay? Can you stop, Kaza, before you get blocked? Okay? Stop being silly and stupid. Focus, please. Don't make it about me. Right? You're not my type. I'm not interested. Anyway, focus, guys. Man, the people, uh, may, they come here and they make it about me. Sam, uh, what do you, what toothpaste do you use, Sam? Because I want to brush my teeth the way you do. Do you use Colgate or do you use Crest? And do you use that like, Colgate that has uh, scope with it? or And what size toothbrush, Sam? And uh, when, when you have a cheat day, what, what, uh, what do you like to eat? Yeah. One more thing, one more thing about me, cuz, and I'm going to send you packing. Okay. All right, now. Let's go to the first clip. Sam, uh, yeah, well, well, how do you brush your teeth, Sam? Left to right or right to left? Dude, stop making it about me, man. Silly, stupid, dude. Sam, uh, yeah, well, yeah, uh, Sam I know he's a Syrian. He's passing because he's a Syrian. You know, they tougher here. But, 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 but. All right. Sorry, guys. May the Lord Jesus constrain me to glorify him and not because to stumble and cause other people to stumble. Okay, here you go. Muslims are going to manifest, all right? Muslims going to manifest. Here we go. Let's start. Ready? Here it goes. Okay, I'm going to this website, yeah? He's going to be reciting the Quran in plain English. He's going to recite Quran. Watch him recite Quran in English, being like Muhammad. Listen, here's the link. Watch here. Uh, the website is lying to you. I can't believe they're lying to you about your Quran. Go to the Quran itself, sir. That's what it means, but I've been, I've been learning that I've been learning since that. I was five years old. I know this stuff. Yeah. I've been learning since I was five years old. I know this stuff. I've been learning. I've been learning. I've been learning since I was five years old. I know this stuff, okay? I'm not an actor, so I can't imitate all these different dialects and accents. But listen. They've been lying to you. And you They've said you lying. never read the Quran. You, you think every single imam lied to me? I read it in English. So now Hatun kept saying, you said you never read the Quran. And I'm going to say, Hatun, repent. He recites Quran beautifully. He's mastered the Quran because he's about to recite the Quran. Notice him recite the Quran. Guys, look how beautiful the Quran sounds in translation. English yes. and, and Arabic. Yes, they lied, yes, they lied to you. you. You told us you never read the Quran, though. You told us you never read the Quran. The Quran can't be faked. The Bible can't be faked. The Bible can't be faked, but the Quran can't be faked. 
Okay, you said you've never read the Quran though. I read it in English and Arabic when I was younger. No, you'd lie so to us. You, you, you recorded. Lied you us. said you never read. It. It, so even let me let me the, let me just step in. Let it, me just step in because it, I this before it, I kick you out, sir. I'm gonna step in before I kick you out. Bible, yeah. uh, basic information before you leave the earth. Okay. Yo, contains, fuck you. Contains, fuck you. So, contains information. Contains information which is affecting your eternity. Abandoned you, fucking. Your family abandoned you, you fucking whore. They don't. They disowned you. Your mom disowned you, bitch. See. One more time. You see how beautiful the crown sounded from the Let me just step in. Let me just step in because I this before I kick you out, sir. I'm gonna step in before I kick you out. Bible. Uh, am I uh, buffering again? Come on. Sorry, guys. This is the best. Hold on. I don't know what's going on with the connection. Yeah. Sorry, guys. Come on, Alex. You got to get better connection, dude. Connection in Florida sucks, buddy. Yeah, it's too late now. I'm going to lose the live stream. But it's everywhere. It's terrible, sir. I'll never come back if you don't get better connection. I'll throw you out of your apartment. All right. All right. Now, listen, guys. Listen. Look, you see how beautiful the crown sounds from his mouth? Beautiful, right? That was perfect Quran. So Hatun lied when she says he never read the Quran. He was reciting the Quran beautifully. So notice the demon manifests, the same demon that molested Muhammad was burning in hell, in hell. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for damning that pig Muhammad, that satanic slut in hell. But I don't mean to insult sluts or pigs. They're cleaner than Muhammad. Watch. Basic information before you leave the earth. Okay. Yo, contains, fuck you. contains, contains fuck you. information, fuck you. contains information fuck you. which is fuck affecting you. your eternity. Abandoned you, fucking. Whore. Your family abandoned you, you fucking whore. They don't. They disowned you. Your mom disowned you, bitch. See. Okay. You got it. Yeah, your mom disowned you, you fucking whore. Daughter of Christ is a little slut. You know what? Okay, yeah. I'm quite happy for. Um, that's this. That's what Muslims do. The same Muslims that come on my Skype, and the ones that come on my comment section saying I'm a white beater, I don't pay child support, and I abuse my children, thinking they have court documents, and somehow the lawyers are speaking the truth about me. See, this is the same spirit, guys. You see that? Are you seeing it right? This is the spirit of Muhammad, the same wicked, evil demon that raped Muhammad spiritually, molested Muhammad spiritually, making him a filthy pedophile, rapist, murderer, who's burning in hell under the wrath of the Lord Jesus. May the Lord Jesus wipe him out and his religion. That same spirit manifests th through those who follow Muhammad. You see, same thing. They do it to all of us because they can't refute the facts. They cannot intimidate us. We're not going to back down by the power of the Holy Spirit filling us to glorify Jesus and live for Jesus and die as lions and lionesses for Jesus. We're going to destroy Muhammad and we're going to desecrate Muhammad and we're going to destroy his filthy Quran, which is worse than my toilet. Right? And this is all they can do. Insult you, slander you, if not murder you. If they can murder you, they would do that. Okay, now watch. Let's one more time. I want you to hear it. This is Islam. Okay. I'm not going to answer that question. Call now. Uh, beloved, whatever people say, you are wonderful and beautiful. Don't see what he said to the daughter of Christ? So, even you see what he said to daughter of Christ? Called her a slut. And then we have my brothers and sisters, Jesus Christ, saying, don't stoop to their level. And you're right. Proverbs 26, verse 4 says, do not answer a fool according to his folly stupidity lest you become like him but then proverbs 26 verse 5 says answer a fool according to his folly lest he becomes wise in his own mind there is a time and place and i do acknowledge and i want to give credit where credit is due again i want to say this you know there is a sister you guys know her you know who she is tatiana who loves the lord jesus christ she's she is a lioness she is really a woman of faith who loves the lord and is always holding accountable out of her love for the Lord to call me to a higher standard. And I want her to hear this. I agree. I want to take it to a higher level because I've already shown these dogs I'm willing to stoop to their level and get dirty and insult them to teach them respect and fear the Lord. But I've done my part. I want to now 
apply Proverbs 26, verse 4, and let others now <clears throat> rise up. We have Christians that are too soft and effeminate. You need to be more assertive and more bold like Elijah and Elisha and Samuel and this can go on and on. And we who have already shown, we won't back down and we will insult and belittle you and muzzle you and shame your wicked, filthy prophet for the glory of Jesus Christ. We've done our part. We now want to <clears throat> ignore this and take it to our level. And I'm trying. She's right. And I praise God for her life. And I praise God for all you sisters who are on fire for the Lord. There are many of you. You know who you are. Right? But you see? You see how they are? This is all they can do. Now watch again. Look what he said. Look how he treated your sisters in the Lord. Watch. Let, let, me, let me just step in. Let me just step in because I this before I kick you out, sir. I'm gonna step in before I kick you out. Bible, yeah. uh, basic information before you leave the earth. Okay. Yo, contains, fuck you. Contains, fuck you. contains information. Contains information which is affecting your eternity. Bible, you fucking. Your family abandoned you, you fucking whore. You they, don't, they disowned you. Your, your family abandoned you. They disowned you. You effing, right? You see? I'm disowned, you bitch. Hmm? <laughs> yeah. Mom disowned you, you fucking whore. The daughter of Christ is a little slut. You know what? Okay. I'm quite happy for... Um, I'm not going to answer that question. Call now. Uh, beloved, whatever people say, you are wonderful and beautiful daughter of Most High King. Um, just don't kind of fall into those stupid um, oh, I things. don't care. I don't so, care. Um, what, what he, just showed, he just showed the, what, what kind of religion he follows. So, yeah. Bible, which is basic okay, information you for it. you. There you go. That's Islam. That's Islam for you. You see? This is what we're dealing with, folks. So you guys better believe you're in spiritual battle and it may cost you your life. So instead of chiming in and telling us how we should minister to Muslims, pray for us. Pray for us who are on the front lines, whom uh, have a platform where we show our faces. They know what Hatun looks like. They try to stab her. The glory to Jesus Christ. They failed and God is, was pleased to extend her earthly life. They know our face. They know what we look like. They know where, where we travel because we're not afraid. We don't have bodyguards. We don't have British agents assigned to us 24 hours a day at the expense of the government. I don't have bodyguards following me. I travel alone, humanly speaking. So does David Wood. That's why I love David. And just for the record, the disagreements that David has with me and I with him, that doesn't mean David is not my brother in Christ and he's not a warrior. I'm going to say it again. He is the General C. Patton of Christianity. General C. Patton of Christianity. He is a genius and a gift of Jesus Christ to destroy Islam and atheism. May God preserve his life and his family, give him many years of the Lord tarries to annihilate atheism and Islam. And may the Lord always be pleased to use me to have his back. As long as my brother David does not decide to attack and mock Catholics and Orthodox, I will always have his back. But if he ends up attacking Catholics and Orthodox like Vocab Anthony, then I have no choice but to cut off ties until he repents. Right? Kaza, I wish I can cuss you out and swear at you and insult you because you're worse than a Mohammedan. But if I do, then Tatiana is going to listen and she's going to get angry with me and saying, that I'm not being Christ-like, and I'm not doing it for Tatiana, but she is amazing, who loves the Lord, who's holding me accountable. She's right. And I'm trying to constrain myself for the glory of the Lord. I really want to. I just got done explaining to this guy what we're talking about, but Kaza, I'm not interested in you. I don't know if you're a woman. You're not my type. You're uglier than Sargon. You're never going to get married. Become a nun. Start a, a nunnery. You have no hope of getting married. And if you're a guy, definitely become a monk, right? Become celibate. Please help the world. Don't spread your seed. Go live in a cave somewhere, dude, and get out of here. 
yeah. Anyway, so there you go, folks. So instead of being armchair warriors, armchair warriors telling us what to do, pray for us. Pray that God's spirit will fill us. God's spirit will constrain us. God's spirit will perfectly control our tongues by his infinite power, never allowing us to shame, deny, blaspheme Jesus Christ, or say something that will bring disgrace to the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, that he will control our tongues, not for the sake of men, their views, but for the glory of Christ. But stop being what we call armchair quarterbacks, right? If you're not doing it, sit back. And again, I don't say this to say this because they're here. I'm going to tell you the men to support. The men that I believe are men of integrity who are not about tickling ears or trying to get money. Obviously, we know Christian Prince. He's, he's there. He does what he does. And we, we don't need to mention him. Rob Christian, he's here. And I'm not saying because he's there. I've said it when he's not here. Osama Dakdo, Jay Smith. Because Jay Smith will come out and tell you who Muhammad is and where he came from and what his Islam is all about. And they've tried to beat him up and kill him. Al Fadi, definitely. you got to help that man. Adam Seeker. Bob the Builder. Right? <clears throat> there, you, know, you have also our sister, Light of Christ for the Nations, whose YouTube channel is always getting shut down. She has started more YouTube channels in history than any person I've known. She's going to be, or he's going to be, he or she, we won't mention her identity, he or she, she, she or he's going to be in the Guinness Book of World Records for the person who's had the most YouTube accounts shut down. So support that brother, that sister. And there are a lot of others. You know, I can't mention them all. If I don't mention them, is that because I don't think uh, highly of you? The ones I'm not fond of, you know who I'm not fond of. You know who I'm not fond of. So we won't go there. So with that said, that was the first clip. And here's my advice to you. I want to say this from my heart. Unfortunately, we've had people who have fallen in love with Muslims. And I'm not mentioning any particular individual because even on my channel, there are a handful of you. You know you are. You see the true face of Islam. This is it. They hate your God. They hate your Jesus. They hate your gospel, they hate your Bible, and they hate your church. Now, some have yoked themselves with Muslims, and your responsibility now is to carry your cross, deny yourself, be Jesus to your Muslim spouse. Let them see Jesus in you, okay? Because now you are under obligation to live in such a way that you live above reproach, that when that Muslim husband or wife, because there are men who marry Muslim women, okay, it's not just the women, that when they see the way you live, they will have no reason to question your faith, but stand in awe of how different you are because you stand out because you serve the real God unlike them. And let your good conduct be used of the Spirit to bring them to faith. There are others of you who are in relationships with Muslims now, men or women. Repent. You need to die to that relationship right now. You are in sin. If you are someone who professes to love Jesus Christ and you're following Jesus Christ, you are in sin. Especially if you are sexually intimate, you are now fornicating. So you've added sin to sin. You need to repent. Ask the Holy Spirit to forgive you. Destroy that relationship. Cut it off. Turn away from it. Never to return. And get right with the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay? You need to do that now. You know who you are. Not, and again, uh, there is no one person here that I'm pointing to. Because I'm not aware of anyone that's dating a Muslim right now. So don't think... I'm being personal with you. If it's convicting you, then ask yourself why. Could it be the Holy Spirit speaking to you? So I'm, I'm not pointing to any one individual because I'm not aware anyone here is dating a Muslim. I'm not aware of that. And I hope you're not. You need to repent. They don't worship your God. They don't love your Jesus. 
They don't have the same spirit you have. They don't love your gospel. They don't love your church. And there are enough godly men out there. There are enough godly men out there and godly women out there that you don't need to be dating a non-Christian. Be patient on the Lord and wait. And I'll tell you what the Lord will do as part of discipline. Okay? Please hear me out. Because these sessions are not just to refute cults. It's to teach us our faith. And not just teach us theology, but practical application. How to live our faith. How to understand our faith so we can live it by the power of the Holy Spirit for the glory of Jesus Christ. So I'm not going to tickle your ears. If I offend you, I'm not trying to. It's because Jesus loves you that he wants you to hear this. Okay. One of the consequences of not being patient on the Lord and going out with a person who's not of the faith is that the Lord won't bless that union. Your life will be hell. While you're dating, and it'll be even worse when you're married, because now, not only if you're married, you got kids. How are you going to raise your kids? And then your kids see mom and dad fighting over religion, and then you leave them discombobulated and baffled what religion is true. So don't live for the moment. Don't live because of your feelings. Think long term. Okay, if I marry this woman who's a Muslim, if I marry this man who's a Muslim, we're going to have kids. What's going to happen then? I want to take them to church. He or she wants to take them to the mosque. I want them to get baptized. He or she wants to recite in their ear, Shahada, there is no God but Allah, and Muhammad is his messenger. How are we going to raise the kids? Where are we going to get married? He wants an imam to come and pray, and I want my priest or my bishop to pray and do the ceremony. And then what about the religious festivities? I want to celebrate Christmas and Easter. He wants me to celebrate Eid, the breaking of Ramadan, and say Eid Mubarak or Eid al Adha or Eid al. You get the point, right? You get the point? So you're going to suffer that. But then another way you'll suffer is if you made the mistake of dating someone outside the faith, not just Muslim, and by the grace of God, you've broken away and You've repented. One consequence of that is that the Lord teaching you now to never act on impulse and emotion. That godly man or woman that you're looking for may not be coming anytime soon. And I'll tell you why. God is not just concerned about what's best for you. He's also concerned what's best for the other person. So God is not all, all about, hey, Sam needs a wife. He's also thinking, well, if I bring Sam a wife, can Sam honor my daughter and cherish her and help her, cause her by the Spirit to go to a higher level of int intimacy with Jesus? So he's not just thinking how wife will benefit me. Will I benefit her? Because Jesus loves the husband and the wife equally. He's not concerned with what the wife can do for the husband. He's concerned what the husband can also do for the wife because he loves them both, right? Everyone with me so far? We got a lot to talk about if you're okay with me talking about it. Because it's, in my channel, I'm trusting the Spirit to take over my tongue because I want the Holy Spirit to give us practical application, how to live our faith, what to do, what not to do, and the areas where we have freedom. What is the faith and how to understand it and how to refute Blasphemies and objections against our faith. Everyone with me? I have suffered because I didn't wait on the Lord. I didn't trust the Lord. I rushed in and got married to someone that God gave me clear signs not to marry, even though she made a profession of faith and claimed to follow the Lord. I ignored the clear message from the Lord. No, Sam, wait. And I went ahead of the Lord, and look, I'm suffering. And my daughters are suffering because I'm not with them. I'm going to repeat the story again. And by the way, there's a reason why I'm wearing my Karate Kid shirt. I met a man years ago when I was still in Protestantism, right? I met him in California. A very financially well-off Christian. Very rich, a millionaire. 
He went to Rick Warren's church in California. Is it, is it Saddle Creek Church? I keep, yeah, it's Saddleback, I'm sorry, because I get it confused with Little Creek. I've shared this story, I'm gonna share it again. Are you guys ready? Are you ready to hear the story? Huh? You ready here? You ready to hear the story? The true story, I've shared it at least three times over the years, Saddleback. I met this man, he was, was devastated, heartbroken, and his mother, was not his mother, his wife was devastated, heartbroken. Here's why. Listen to this, my sisters. His daughter was head of the evangelism or a part of the evangelism team in Saddleback. She was engaged to a Christian man, and they were going to get married. They met a Muslim, and I believe it was at college. Again, it's been a while. I remember the gist of the story, but I met the man and I spoke with the man, the father, and I, I met the mother. As they were trying to influence the Muslim, this filth, this garbage, and I pray you get saved because Jesus loves Muslims, wants to save them. But this guy's garbage for another reason. Anyone who does this, irrespective of religion, he's filth and garbage. And I'll tell you why I'm calling him garbage. Knowing she's a Christian and she's engaged to a Christian man, he started hitting on her. And being stupid and naive, she put her guards down, gave him the number, and they started talking on the side, unbeknownst to her fiancé. Slowly but surely, she fell in love with that Muslim, broke it off with her fiancé, left Christianity, became a Muslim, denounced the faith, Married the man and relocated to Jordan. That's what she did. Now, when I met the father, they were engaged. The daughter was engaged, but she was a Muslim. He reached out to Nabil Qureshi, who was alive at that time. Nabil Qureshi was alive. Nabil Qureshi spoke to that Muslim man, answered the objections, but the man didn't care. He got what he wanted. He got the booty, the plunder. He was praying on that Christian one because it is a great victory, a great victory to Allah and his messenger for a Muslim man to take a Christian woman, deflower her or sexually defile her and or marry her and have kids with her. It is a victory for Allah and his messenger. That's how they take it. So when I met him, they were engaged. I heard later she got married and went to Jordan, and him being so desperate, he bought a home in Jordan so he could be there next to his daughter. So neither his money nor the church could help his daughter. Okay? This is why I get upset and livid at my sisters when I find out sisters dated Muslim men. Now, by the way, some of you may be married to Muslim men or Muslim women. I'm not attacking you guys. Honestly, hear my heart. Jesus bless you and redeem that marriage for his glory. But now this is your cross. Now you're carrying a cross because I don't need to tell you, because I know you are now suffering because of that decision of marrying a Muslim. Because it's affecting your worship and it's affecting, if you have children, how you raise them. But Jesus Almighty loves you. I just want to assure you, he loves you. It's under the blood. But now he's telling you, this is your cross. Okay, carry your cross and suffer, and I will redeem it for my glory. So I'm not condemning you. So please don't misunderstand me. And I mean that from my heart. But this is what gets me upset with some of the sisters who've gone with Muslim men and didn't last because you don't understand the mindset of the Muslim man. To him, he scored a mighty victory for Allah and his messenger because he took a Christian woman, defiled her sexually, confirming what Muslims say about our women, our sisters, they are whores. In the West, all Christian women are whores. That's what they think of us. Western women are whores, and they associated that with Christianity. And you're doing nothing to destroy that stereotype by dating them and allowing them to have sex with you. This is why it drives me upset, and I get livid and disgusted. Why would you do this to yourself? Justify their stereotype of Western women 
that Western women, because they're Christian, they're not Muslim, they're whores. Why? Why would you do that? So everyone clear now? Because that's what they think. And if you think men don't talk, you don't know men, sisters. I'm a man. Well, some people think I'm not a man. But anyway. I'll tell you how men are, especially if they're Muslim men. You, you see that that Western Christian girl? I was tapping that. Sorry to use straight language. She's a whore, man. Oh, really? And the next guy lines up to defile you. You don't need that reputation. And you don't need to cheapen yourself. And you don't need to be another notch on a Muslim belt or a trophy that they <clears throat> parade for all on his messenger. Don't do that to yourself and to the honor of Christ who loves you. Please don't do that, sisters, especially the brothers. What in the world are you doing dating Muslim women? How and why? How and why? Because do you know that Muslim woman, her family would disown her if they're not liberal Muslims? And secondly, in dating that Muslim woman, they find out you're going to be the cause of that woman being murdered. They're going to murder her in a Muslim country if they're able to take her back to a Muslim land. Do you want that blood on your hands? All right. Now, with that out of the way, let's go to the second. Uh, everyone with me so far? Are we okay? We're now ready for now Hamza Yusuf. Now, this guy really ticked me off. I've left some notes. Left some notes because this was a lecture that popped up, and I thank God. That I watched it because, again, the man is a Western Muslim scholar who knows that in the West he has to lie and deceive like his God and prophet. And he was one of my favorite West Muslim scholars, but I can see he's no better than the rest. No, uh, non-ominous Moriar, you can't recommend because I guarantee you anything you recommend, we've already written on it. And if you recommend something that I've written on it, which means you haven't searched for it, I'm going to have to block you. So do you want to really recommend? You want to really recommend? Because I'm itching to block people. Because Tatiana is not here to tame me. <laughs> All right, anyway. Okay, now let's go to Hamza Yusuf. Are we ready? Ah, oh, Hamza. Hamza yourself. Oh, yeah, let me tell you a story with my shirt, Okay. Let me tell you the story. Okay. Now tell me what the topic is. Okay, guys, get ready for me to block this guy. One second. Because, yeah, block -itis again. Guys, uh, Protestant believer has binonitis, binolitis, and I have block -itis. Sometimes the itch gets too strong. I can't control myself. I'm itching now. No. No blocking. No blocking. No. No. Okay. Go ahead. What is it? Hold on, he said, he guarantees I haven't addressed this. Okay, go ahead. Let me let me feed my itch. Go ahead, tell me. Come on, we're waiting. What topic you suggest we haven't addressed? I'm going to tell you why I wore the Karate Kid shirt in a minute. But hold on, guys, we're going to give this guy a second. Take 60 seconds for him to respond. And then we're going to go on thumbs up. All right? I know there is a cure for my blockalitis, but we won't mention it. Okay, guys, let's get ready. Come on, Nan, because it's going to be Nanya. You're going to be non-existent on my channel if you don't if you don't speed it up. I know there's a 60-second delay. Muslims have been spouting the Egyptian miracle claim on 4429. They claim historical miracle on this that confirms Quran's historicity. Yep, you're out of here, buddy. Bye, bye. Oh, bye, 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 bye. Okay, send our friend out of here. Bye, bye. Thank you. Why did you? Shiami is a sister. Or I think it's a sister. Why did you hide Shiami? Bye, bye. Oh, bye, 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 bye. Oh. Oof. Oh, that feels good. Oof. All right. Now, coming back to the issue. True story, folks. I saw this shirt. At Walmart, see that's that's the fancy place where I shop at, you know, because I'm a millionaire. Anyway, bought it, but let me tell you two reasons why I wore it. 
When I wear anything related to Bruce Lee or Batman, you know someone's going to get hurt. When I wear something related to Bruce Lee or Batman, you know someone's spiritually going to get hurt, not physically. We can't attack someone unless it's for self-defense. We have the right to physically protect our lives and the lives of our loved ones if it's threatened, but we don't have the right to go beat up people who disagree with us. But, right? Yeah, look at this, look at this idiot. I'm dating a Muslim man because they seem to have stronger values sociologically. Yeah, when he defiles you and treats you like me and has sex with you and dumps you like a whore, come back to me and say, yeah, sociologically, they, they seem to be stronger. Yeah, get the hell out of here, man. Okay, focus, guys. Yeah, they have stronger values. They, they sanction pedophilia where they violate minors. They rape married women who are taken captive, committing adultery and rape. And they will beat you if they fear rebellion. And they, they have stronger voice. Yeah, you deserve what you get. Get the hell out of my channel. Get the hell out of here. Now I'm going to hear from Tatiana. She's going to revoke me. I don't think Jesus did. That's why I'll never, you never get married, Sam. You won't think of her. <laughs> All right, anyway. Let me tell you a true story. So that's the first reason why I wear the second reason. It brings back a memory in high school. In high school, in high school, there was a group, <laughs> there was a group of South Asian kids. I don't know if they're Christian or Hindu. It was after school, several South Asian kids, you know, we're teenagers, either Indians or Pakistanis, they got into a fight. So there's this tall dude who supposedly knows karate. And there was this short, ugly looking ogre with a thick mustache who's challenging to fight. And he says to him, oh, so you think you know karate? <laughs> so he says to him, karate kid, karate kid, karate kid. And bam, jacks him right in the face. And the karate kid stood there and do not, did nothing. So every time I see karate kid, I have a flashback of that scene in high school where <laughs> these guys from South Asia were sitting there uh, outside, they're standing. They're about to get in the fight. So this tall Indian guy, I don't know if he's in Pakistani, and this short little munchkin, this ogre, this orc, is making fun of uh, the tall guy. Oh, so what? You think you know karate? A karate kid. It's karate kid. Karate kid. And bam, jacked him. And the karate kid did nothing about it. So it brought, brings back those memories. So with that said, let's go to, let's go to Hamda Yusuf. Hamda Yothayel. Let's start at, let's see here. Karate kid, man, why like this, man? Let's see, I left some notes. Let's start at, oh, that's not it. Oh, man, why like this? Why you be like this? Hold on, man. Didat Mubah. Okay, let's go to the two minute, 30 second mark. Two minute, 30 second mark. L listen to his spiel. The link to his lecture is in the description box. I'll start a few seconds earlier. Necessities have their own categories, their own rulings. And, um, and we have many, many examples of this historically throughout history of the Muslims dealing with their circumstances. I'll Listen. just give you an example. In, historically, when Muslims uh, conquered lands. Can you hear him? This is as loud as it gets in the beginning, but he gets a little louder as it goes by. This is the quality. It's, it was posted March 1st, 2022. Muslims then versus Muslims now, the changes Ummah went through, okay? Zaytuna lecture. He started the first official Muslim college in America in Berkeley, California, Zaytuna Institute, Zaytuna College. There were two types of ways that they came into a land. One was what was called Unwatan, and that was Sulhan. So Unwatan is where a people refused, uh, they refused the, the Muslim uh, demands did you catch what he just said this is why lord willing in the near future i will learn how to share my screen on creator studio something i haven't learned yet i wish you could see his face i gave you the link look at his dishonesty and deceit look at how wickedly dishonesty is because you can't be better than the god and the prophet you follow if your god and prophet are evil wicked liars deceivers immoral you can't be better than them because those are your example. He's talking about when Muslims attacked or when Muslims fought 
And he says there were two types, right? They attacked those people that didn't accept the Muslim demands. And you can see how uncomfortable he is because he's in the West and he knows he's being recorded and he's going to be seen on social media platforms and he knows there are going to be non-Muslims listening. And so now he has to contextualize the message of Islam and try to present it in a pal palatable manner for Western consumption because what he did not say is those demands were demands by the Muslim armies who invaded peoples, who invaded lands, countries, cities, and villages, unsuspectingly, peoples who did not pose a threat against Muslims, who were not attacking Muslims, just came up on, on them, demanding they become Muslim or pay jizya or be killed. You see how wickedly dishonest he is? That's why you see how uncomfortable his face is. Um, uh, but let's continue listening because it's going to get worse for him. And so they, they fought it out and then the Muslims won. That had a whole They fought it out moves. and the Muslims won. Why did they fight it out? And why did the people not want to acquiesce and accept those demands, Hamza Yusuf? See that? That went with it. And then if they conquered them under a, a treaty, like a sunnah, then that also they were able to stipulate things. So one with Did you catch it? Oh, if they conquer them by treaty. What treaty? You mean when you went attack Christian lands or Jewish homes and said, look, you can remain a Jew or Christian religiously if you pay jizya, and this will be the contract, the treaty between us. You are now considered dhimma, protected group, as long as you pay the jizya. And if you don't, then we will slaughter you if we win and take your women and children as our property. Now, notice the admission, though. He's going to make some candid admissions because he knows it's in his books. He can't get away from it. Listen. It was like a conditional surrender. The other was like an unconditional surrender. And you see this in early Islam. Conditional um, Surrender versus unconditional. You see this early Islam. The unconditional surrender is when the Muslims attack these lands, beat them, and force them to submit. The other one is when the Jews and Christians realize we're outnumbered, so we're going to surrender under their conditions. See the dishonesty? Why don't you come on and say it, you coward? Because you're in the West, you coward, and you're outnumbered. I wish I could have a debate with you, right? Even though there are people far more qualified than me. That's why Rob Christian... Should either do a session or bring in Usama. And he and Usama can team up. Take this clip, Rob, listen to it, and decimate it. Uh, one of the things uh, in unconditional situations that they would that they would not allow them to build new churches. And so you will find, for instance, that there are periods where a listen. ruler will come and he'll actually order the churches to be torn down. Did you catch it? And you should see his body language. You should see his face. He's so uncomfortable. He is so miserable that he has to admit this. When people were conquered and forced to submit unconditionally, meaning they went to battle with these Jews and Christians, defeated them, and they were forced to submit, then the rulers would come in and destroy their churches. Do you hear it? This is from the horse's mouth. Go watch his face, how uncomfortable he is. That were built in, in the previous administration. So you'll find that in our history books. And these are things that a lot of people that are very anti-Muslim are pulling out because they're going into our sources and looking at our history books. And what's interesting about... Did you catch it? You'll find it in our history books and those anti-Muslims are finding them. Yeah, we're finding them because they're there. This is part of your his history, your heritage. And could it be that the reason why we're anti-Muslim is because of this filth, Hamza Yusuf? Could it be that we hate Islam and your prophet and your God because of the things we see in your sources? What is making us, quote unquote, anti-Muslim? Because we see how evil your God is, evil your prophet is, evil the Islamic expansion was. And you blame us? This is narcissism. See, this is what narcissists do. Study narcissistic personality disorder. Narcissists, what they'll do is they will play the victim, right? 
They will play the victim, right? They will make you look evil, make you look dastardly, even though you're simply responding to their abuse, to their belittling, to their <clears throat> demonization of you. But when you respond, you're evil, you're the bully, you're the villain, and we're the victim. See how it works? See how it works? The anti-Islam, they're fighting against in our sources. Well, uh, Hamza, why do you think I'm an anti-Muslim? Not Muslim, sorry. Let me be careful so you don't misrepresent me. Anti-Islamic. Why do you think I hate your religion and your prophet and your God? Could it be it's because of what I'm finding in your sources? So you blame me? Your prophet and God make Hitler look like a choir boy. This is narcissism. So when Muhammad rapes women, <clears throat> enslaves women and children, prostitutes women, rapes married women, beheads and kills those who criticize his prophethood, we are anti-Islamic Islamophobes for bringing these facts out to warn people and protect people from your kind. And we are Islamophobes because we see how evil your prophet is and we hate him for what he did. But we're the Islamophobes, not your prophet. He's not the one who's at fault. See, listen to this. Notice the rhetoric. About their methodology is that they will cherry pick all the things that blacken Islamic history and, and just they will look at them as simply fact. This is fact. And it here's what's ironic. He just admit their facts. How are we saying something that's not true? You just admit these are in your sources. You just admit there are rulers who would attack people unsuspectingly, who pose no threat to the Islamic empire, who didn't threaten to attack Muslims and kill them. The Muslims came upon them stealthily. And when they couldn't defeat the Muslims, the Muslims enslaved them, took their lands and property, and destroyed their churches. You just admit, you already admit these are in our sources, and we're cherry-picking? No, it's you who's cherry-picking, because you live in the West. Understand what he's doing. He lives in the West. Because he lives in the West, he has to now de-emphasize these aspects of his religion and over-emphasize or focus on those that point a rosy or paint a rosy picture of Muhammad. Because he knows he's in the West. He's in the same circumstances and situation Muhammad found himself in when Muhammad was outnumbered by the unbelievers and they had the military power and the government. So he has to now present a tolerable Islam and paint a rosy picture. And we're cherry picking. Anything that puts the religion in a good light, they will say, oh, this is clearly a contrived story. Uh, it's a nice story told by Muslims to make their religion look nice. And this is a very common, when, when you get into Orientalist uh, tradition, it's a very common motif. For me, it, it really bothers me a lot because uh, they don't challenge uh, a lot of these narratives that I personally would challenge because listen to this the prophet look, look notice the begging the question i challenge those stories that they're not consonant with muhammad because he believes muhammad was a peaceful man a loving man and that these muslim rulers went against the example of muhammad notice what he's saying because i'm going to now destroy that myth but hear him out because it's going to get really bad when he misrepresent muhammad's interaction with the christians of najran so guys bear with me it's going to get really bad for him. Never destroyed a place of worship. And so if, and he prohibited destroying places of worship. So Muhammad never destroyed a place of worship. Even though Muhammad limited himself to the Hejaz area, Mecca and Medina. And Muhammad did destroy the idols of the pagans. That's not considered destroying a place of worship. Okay, that's fine. I'll give you that. Why would I expect Muhammad to destroy places of worship when he himself did not go out with the Muslim hordes, H-O-R-D-E-S, the Muslim contingent army, because when they went out and expanded Islam globally, Muhammad was dead already. So what he tried to do was consolidate 
Arabia and its surrounding environs in order to control that piece of land, if we go with the traditional Islamic narrative as being historical, so he can have enough military prowess, enough soldiers, and enough <clears throat> power and resources to then spread Islam globally and offensively. How do you know that if Muhammad had lived longer and went out to these places, he would not have had churches destroyed? When he even threatened to burn down a particular mosque that had opened in opposition to his mosque. If a Muslim ruler destroys a place of worship that was already built, even if it was built against certain codes or legal restrictions, if it's being used by a religious community, I don't believe the Prophet would have done that. I don't believe. And so to say that this somehow is normative Islam because a ruler did it. And it's not one ruler, Hamza. The leaders of Islam spread Islam offensively through military exped expeditions, going into lands, not their own, attacking peoples who pose no threat to Islam and took over their properties and their lands. Another aspect that we have to remember as Muslims is that Islam was a religious tradition that our prophet told us would only have a polity for 30 years. Now watch this, listen to this. And then after that, he said it wouldn't be Islam. It would be something else. Okay, now let me explain what he said, cherry picking. He just misrepresented the quote unquote Orientalist. Come on up, brother, so I can know about it. Orientalist position, right? He just misrepresented the Orientalist position. So I'll, I guess I'll see you later. All right, brother, I'll see you. And I'll probably go walk again. We'll do something tonight. Lord bless you. So pray for my host. He's an evangelist who loves the Lord, and he's being gracious enough to allow me to use his home and to teach. So pray for this, brother. He's a blessing. Now, coming back to the issue, listen to this. I want you to hear this. He says that Orientalists will say that those stories that present Muhammad or Islam in a rosy fashion picture, those, he says Orientalists will say those are made up. No, no, that's not the argument, Hamza. Let me tell you what the argument is. Just because you may have certain examples or instances where Muhammad and his followers did something noble, that doesn't undo or change the fact of all the atrocities and evils and wickedness that your prophet and his followers and Muslim rulers carried out in the name of your God. It's like me saying, hey, why do you focus on what Hitler did, killing so many millions, millions of people? Why don't you focus on all the good he did and all the humanitarian causes? Why do you cherry pick from the life of Hitler? That's what he's telling you. You understand the logic here? <laughs> That's what he's telling you. See, it's not fair you guys focus on what Hitler did in murdering, murdering so many people. See, because Hitler did a lot of noble things. He was a humanitarian, and he did a lot of good, and so did his Reich. Why don't you focus on that, you cherry pickers, you Nazi-phobes, you anti-Nazis? Right? That's number one. Number two. The reason why there would be scholars who would question, the reason why there would be scholars who would question those elements of Islam where Muhammad is point, painted, pointed, Lord Jesus, guard my tongue and the words of my mouth, where Muhammad is painted as this, you know, Superman, you know, as this holy monk is because Human tendency is to make your heroes look better. We don't expect people to portray and present their heroes in a negative light unless those episodes are historical. In other words, I don't expect a Muslim to admit that Muhammad recited verses from Satan praising the three daughters of Allah, these goddesses. I don't expect them to do that. Because that means Muhammad violated monotheism and committed the unforgivable sin. I don't expect Muslims to make up a story of Muhammad at the age of 54 marrying a nine-year-old prepubescent, premature minor and leaving her a widow at 18. I don't expect Muslims to make up a story where Muhammad lusts for a married woman who is his daughter-in-law 
causing his son, his adopted son, Zayed, to divorce her so he can then devour her and ravish her sexually and then abolish adoption as a result, unless this is historical. See, we don't expect Muslims who love Muhammad to come up with such stories. But we do expect those who love Muhammad to make him better than he is, to embellish his story, to make him comparable to Jesus. See, that's the logic, right? That's the logic. That's why non-Muslims and specialists in Islam who are not Muslims will hold in suspicion any story that makes Muhammad look exceptional, especially comparable to Jesus, when those traditions may even contradict what the Quran says, such as Muhammad's miracles. The Quran says he did none, but then the traditions have him doing many, some of which are comparable to the miracles of Moses and Jesus, right? So those stories, they will hold in suspicion. But an Orientalist studying Islam realizes which Muslim in his right mind, if he loves Muhammad, would depict Muhammad as being a pedophile, as being a rapist, as being a whoremonger, as being lustful of a married woman, causing a divorce, taking that married woman, committing adultery and destroying adoption. These elements we don't expect Muslims to make up because they show how evil and wicked and immoral Muhammad is. So that makes them more likely to be historical. Do you see the difference? That's the method. Are you guys learning what's called the historical method? This is known as the principle, the criterion of embarrassment. Everyone with me there? You understand? The principle that causes serious historians to take those elements that make Muhammad look pretty wicked and evil and stupid and immoral as most likely historical, but the stories where it makes him look like a saint or comparable to Jesus, that's more, more likely to have been embellished. But even if we assume those elements are true, how does those aspects of Muhammad's supposedly noble life undo do away with, change the fact of all the evil and wickedness and immorality that he and his followers engaged in. Again, let me repeat what the analogy is. The analogy is like someone telling me, you know, you're a cherry picker, even though I don't like cherries. Why am I a cherry picker? Look at how you treat Hitler, man. What do you mean? Why do you only focus on all the bad that Hitler did? Can't you talk about some of the good humanitarian things he did? Can't you talk about the orphanages or the hospitals or how he cared for people and he paid people's debts off? I mean, come on, dude. You're such an anti-Nazi. You're a Nazi foe. You got Nazi-litis. Be fair. Be balanced. That's what Hamza Yusuf's telling you. Okay, now let's jump to the 11-minute the 11 minute, 29 second mark. Here we're gonna have fun. Here we're gonna have fun, folks. 11 minute, 29 second mark. I hope you guys are learning how to argue, how not to argue, and refute this nonsense, the garbage by these so-called westernized Muslim scholars. 11.29, now notice what he's gonna say about the Orientalist again, and the example he gives to show that Muhammad wouldn't do what some of these Muslim rulers did. Guys, this has to do with jizya. This is why I robbed Christian. Watch this video, take clips out of it, and maybe you do a session by yourself or have Usama and his slides. You're going to have fun with this guy because you got all the sources in the original language. Now watch. Look what he's going to say about Jizya and how it was paid. Listen. I'll give you one example. In the verse which is in Toba, where it says that they're supposed to pay Jizya, Jizya to Toba is chapter 9. Surat al-Bara'a, Bara'a. Toba, repentance and the immunity, the annulment of treaties. Chapter 9, verse 29, they pay jizya. Now notice what he's going to admit. Notice what he's going to admit. Right? So there's the jumla hadi as wahum sahirun, that they should pay this tribute in a humbled manner. Wahum sahirun. If you read the books of fiqh, you will you'll see amazing things. Some of them said, oh. We have to humiliate them. This is from the horse's mouth. Guys, listen to what Hamza is admitting to you. 
If you study the fit manuals, Islamic jurisprudence manuals, they will tell you on the basis of this verse, you have to humiliate the Jews and Christians when they come and pay jizya because the word says sahirun, humiliated, debased, belittled. And so when you go to the manuals on Islamic jurisprudence telling you how to apply this command to the Jews and Christians who pay jizya, what will you find, Hamza? Yeah. And so this, in a humbled manner, وَهُمْ sahirun. If you read the books of fiqh, you will, you'll see amazing things. Some of them said, oh, we have to humiliate them. We have to. Why do you think they said that, Hamza? Because you just quoted the word in Arabic, sahirun. Also used in 2737 when Solomon supposedly humiliated the queen of Sheba or wanted to. A military expedition do a jihad to humiliate her and her followers for worshiping the sun. So where did they get that you got to humiliate Jews and Christians for paying jizya because they pay jizya as a sign that the Muslims have humiliated them? Where did they get that, Hamza? You quoted it, chapter 9, verse 29. Chapter 9, verse 29. The Quran says, so they feel humiliated. Now watch what he's going to go on to say. And so this is not from prophetic practice. This is their interpretations of a verse in the Quran. So they would say they should pay it at 12 p.m., 12 noon, the hottest part of the day. They should pay it without their head cover. You see what he's telling you is in their books. You just had the man admit in his books of Islamic church ruins. When the Muslim <clears throat> fuqaha, the faqih, the, the legal expert, interpret how to apply this verse from the Quran, he says, make sure it's the hottest Time of the day, so they can feel the heat beating on them. Have them remove their ha hat, so the sun will burn their heads, beat on them. And what else? He just said these are in his books. You just heard him it. These are in his books. Um, they should always put their hand, offer the money like this, so the Muslim... Okay, let me explain what he says. He said, and it says, when the Jews and Christians come and pay jizya, they have to offer it like this. So I can't come and put the money in the palm of the Muslim ruler. I have to offer it to the Muslim ruler because the high hand is better than the lower hand. So to show that the Muslims are higher and better than the Jews and Christians, a Christian Jew had to come with the money this way, and the Muslim comes and takes it this way to show that the Muslim is higher and better because he has the upper hand. So he takes it this way. So I come and he takes it this way. That's what he's showing you in the clip. Takes the money from above because yet al ulya khairum and yet sufla, right? And and the, the hand over is better than the hand up, uh, under, meaning the one giving is better than the one taking. So in this case, you know they had to offer the money like that instead of like that. That's one view. And one the view? Fuqaha, you'll find that in the books. And the, the fuqaha, you'll find that in the books. But he doesn't tell you that many, if not most, say this is what it means. So he knows it's in the books. And he knows we Christians and Jews and others are reading his books. So they can't hide this from us because their books are accessible. So what do I do? Poor me, I'm in the West. And these people have access to our books like Abuna Zakaria or Christian Prince or Rob Christian or Sama Daktuk because they can read the Arabic. And now they're being translated so that David Wood and Sam Shimon and Apostate Prop, they are reading it and we're embarrassed. That's why it's the tsunami. Thousands and hundreds of thousands leaving Islam because they're exposing us. So I can't deny it, but let me try to betrust it. You know, you know. <clears throat> let me try to lessen the impact. Let me try to make it a little less evil than it appears. Yeah, that's that's what, you know, but he only mentions one. Of all these scholars, he can point to one. And what does that one say? These are the things that uh, these Islamophobes pull out of our books and say, well, there, look at this tolerant religion. And then So we're, we're the Islamophobes. You see? Folks, if you haven't studied narcissism, and I'm not an expert, I've had to study it here and there, but I gave up on it because I can't spend my life studying narcissism. I was forced to study it for my own personal reasons. I had, I had my experience. 
Go and Google narcissistic personality disorder. The narcissist has to control you. And part of that way of controlling you is to belittle you, debase you, make you feel worthless without him or her. And that the only value you have is in serving that person. But if you stand up to the narcissist, narcissist then they become the victim and make you the villain. This is narcissism. This is narcissism. We are the Islamophobes because we're reading this garbage in your books and we're troubled by it and we're disgusted by it and we hate what we see. So we hate your prophet and your God and we're warning people and that makes us Islamophobes. Right? That makes us Islamophobes. You see that? We're the ones who are Islamophobes. Okay, let's continue. Then you have people like Abu Ubaid and Kitab al Amwal, one of the great fuqaha of Islamic tradition who argues. Why is he great? He's great, this fuqi, one of the fuqaha. Why is he great? Because he's he gives me an opinion that I can run with in the West in order to try to lessen the impact of what all these other fuqaha said that shows the true face of Islam. So thank you that I can at least appeal to you. Thank you, man. You bailed me out in the West. Listen. That just paying tribute is humbling enough. So honor them and treat them well and don't humiliate them. in Don't humiliate them in what? Paying their tribute. So there's another faqih who comes up with a completely different approach. Wait, you can only mention one faqih to try to mitigate against what all these other fuqaha say? So let's ignore what all these other people say that pretty much spell out what the Arabic Quran says, Sahirun. They pay jizya to show they've been humiliated, disgraced, belittled, debased. That's what the word means. Let's ignore that they're being faithful to the Arabic, because remember, the Quran is plain Arabic for those who know Arabic, and go with this opinion because it makes it easier uh, to swallow and more tolerable because I'm a Muslim in the West surrounded by majority of unbelievers. So his opinion sells. Yeah, you know, just take it. Don't humiliate them because what he means is they're already humiliated by pain. You've already humiliated them. Because the payment means they've been humiliated. So don't add insult to injury. Gee, that's really, that really gives me like, whoo, solace. Guys, for a minute, I was like, oh my goodness. You know, thank goodness that, you know, uh, they won't make me take off my hat when it's really hot in the heat of the day and won't make me give it, you know, with, with my hand stretched out, the money in my palm, so that the Muslim ruler can then take it out of my hand as a sign that he has the upper hand over me. Thank goodness, because, you know, that, that makes me feel better that I'm paying jizya, even though the payment of jizya is itself a sign that I've been humiliated and debased and subjugated. Wow, that really gives me solace. Man, feeling good. Orthodox Shada said, one thing that Hamza Yusuf won't say is that the fiqh books mandate that the Muslim woman has to go with the Mutamid positions, not cherry pick individual scholars. Exactly, brother, because he's in the West. But guys, aren't you thankful? Aren't you thankful that this one faqi, this one faqi, even the word sounds nasty, doesn't it? You know, this one faqi says, hey, don't humiliate them. Because they're paying jizya as it is. Don't humiliate. And by the way, do me a favor. Report this guy. This guy who misspelled my ex-wife's name because he took a picture of my daughter. There's a picture of my daughter that he's been now stalking. That means he's a stalker. Can you report his page? Because that's my baby daughter that he put a picture of. Be there are men behind the screen. They won't face me face to face because they're threatening my daughters. Watch what I'll do to them because they're threatening my daughters. But you're less man than your mother was when the Shia did her. All right? So anyway, with that said, focus. So, but guys, that gives me solace. Why does that give me solace? Solace. Because 
as long as they don't make me take my hat in the heat of the day and stretch out my hand with the with the coinage in the palm of my hand, I'm okay paying jizya, even though jizya itself, guys, understand, jizya itself, jizya itself is a sign the Muslims have humiliated you, subjugated you, and disgraced you. So the payment itself means Muslims have humiliated you. Okay? Just keep that in mind. So let's go. Let's continue. And so what is it? Which one is it? They're both from the quote-unquote tradition. And this is the lawsuit that we inherit. And So he admits it. He admits it. They're both in our tradition. We can't get rid of them. So which one do we opt for? We know which one you're going to opt for, Hamza, because you're in the West and you're surrounded by the unbelievers, the kuffar, who are exposing your filthy prophet and your deen. And you know the tsunami effect it has. So now you're going to conveniently opt for the more tolerable view in order to salvage your fake prophet. You see why he's wicked and dishonest, folks? You see why we need to do these sessions to expose these people? We need Because this man is in Berkeley, California. He started a Muslim college, the first accredited Muslim college, Zaytuna Institute in Berkeley, California. He is influencing Westerners to become Muslim with this version of Islam. He is dangerous. And then we have to ask ourselves, what is closest to our prophet's behavior? You How really want to know what's closest to your prophet's behavior? The irony. The closest to your prophet's behavior is when he has the upper hand and he has enough military prowess and resources, then he'll attack places, villages, murder the men, rape the cap captive women, even if they're married, sell them off as chattel, and slave the children. That's what your prophet would do when he has the upper hand. How was he with people when the Christians of Najran came to Medina in, in according to one recension in the ninth year of Hijrah? How did he treat them? Okay, pay attention, Najran. This is where it will be burial for Muhammad, Allah, Ahmad, Idat, and Hamza Yusuf. He mentioned the Christians in Najran. These Christians from Najran, when they came to Medina, how did he treat them? Watch here. Look at how wicked the dishonesty is. This is now meat. You thought this was meat? The meat is now being served. That was all appetizer. Watch what how much fun we're gonna have. According to our books, he, he let them pray in the in the masjid when they debated. Keep in mind, he said he let them pray in the masjid. Please keep in mind. I already given you links to series of articles rebuttals in the description box related to his lies being refuted. It's there, guys. They're all in the description box. Lord willing, when the session is done, I'll pin it as a comment. Listen, he let them pray in the mosque. Keep that in mind. With him about, for instance, Ya Ukhta Harun, they said about Mary, you've confused Mary, the sister of Moses, with Mary, the mother of Jesus. Because in Okay, so notice second point. These are the highlights we're going to address. You got to listen. Point number one, the Christians of Najan came to Muhammad Medina, and he was kind to them, let them pray in his masjid, his mosque. Point number two, they debated him whether Mary is the sister of Aaron, meaning the sister of Moses, when there's a gap between Moses and Jesus. So they brought that up. So what does Muhammad respond? Notice his response. Because now we're going to have a meat fest for the glory of Jesus. In the Quran, Mary, the virgin, is called the sister of Harun. And the Prophet said, wasn't she an Aaronite? Because the Aaronites were the, uh, the shrine keepers. And Mary was from the offspring of Aaron. So Mary was from the offspring of Aaron. Now remember, he's a scholar. He studied the Islamic sources. He knows what the sources say about Jesus' lineage. I'm going to expose this fraud for all to see. You owe to yourself to study the articles, rebuttals, and study the session. Learn. Ask the Holy Spirit to help you learn to understand what you're hearing correctly so you can pass it on correctly because then you will be the destruction of Islam by the power of the Holy Spirit. So Mary is the lineage of Aaron. That's what he said, right? Brother of Moses. So he was explaining because the Arabs say, Ya Akhtar Arab or Ya Akhtar Arab. When you're ya Akhtar Arab means sister of Arab or Akhtar Arab, meaning, you know, of the Arabs. Keep that in mind. What does that mean if you say sister of Arab or brother of Arab, Akhtar Arab, Arab? From a people, you call them the sister of that people. So she was an Aaronite. So he was saying, that's not a confusion. 
She was an Aaronite. So when you are from a people, you call them the brother of that people or the sister of that people. So she was an Aaronite from Aaron. So you say sister of Aaron. Problem number one, and I'll go in depth. Aaron wasn't a people. Aaron belonged to the tribe of Levi. Levi was the people group. So if he was right that Mary was from the line of Aaron, then you wouldn't call her the sister of Aaron because he's not a people group. The people group that Aaron belonged to is Levi. It is Levi who has a tribe named after him. So she should have been called sister of Levi, which is the tribe of Aaron. First lie, busted. Second lie, keep, up, keep listen to me, second lie. When you want to talk about someone's ancestry lineage, you don't say sister of in Hebrew. You say daughter of. So if it's really saying she's a descendant of Aaron, she would be called daughter of Aaron, not sister of Aaron, or a daughter of Levi, not sister of Levi. Nowhere in the Old and New Testaments, and prove me wrong, will you find someone who is part of a lineage or a clan or a tribe said to be the brother of, sister of, they're said to be the son of or daughter of, son of Judah, son of Asher, son of Levi, son of Aaron, son of David, son of Abraham. Even Luke 1.5 says Elizabeth, one of the daughters of Aaron, not one of the sisters of Aaron, because you don't call someone the sister of someone if they are in their physical lineage you say daughter of so those two points destroy his lie but i'm going to destroy the lie that mary was an aaronite just be patient because i want him to make his point you guys learning pray i'm not too loud so i don't distract that's a, a, a epithet that indicates her lineage no it doesn't you're lying so he explained he didn't say off with their heads how dare they question what a liar and this man supposedly is a scholar, interacts with Jewish and Christian scholars. He goes, sister of, shows lineage. You're lying, Hamza. Even in the Quran, even the Quran, guys, it's all in my articles that I link to. When the Quran says the brother of Thamud, that's because he's a contemporary of those people and he's their brother because they're living at the same time. Brother of Thamud refers to someone who's living and is contemporary with those people from that tribe. So to say sister Aaron means that her and Aaron are living at the same time. She's a contemporary of Aaron. So even that usage in the Quran destroys him. Let me get my phone. I'm going to repeat that point again. Let me repeat these points again so you can get it. Okay. And this man is supposedly a scholar, right? This man. And this guy, his parents were scholars. I didn't go, to, again, I'm not trying to boast. I didn't go to college. I didn't go to university. I was thrown out of high school, and I know this. What about this guy? He doesn't know this? He doesn't know this? Huh? Right? Anyway, let me just, uh, let me just come back here. Okay, let me repeat it again. In the Quran, when it says brother of Thamud or brother of the Arabs, don't take my word for it. Don't take my word for it. Look it up. Whenever that phrase is used in the Quran, it refers to contemporaries. Brother of Thamud refers to someone who's contemporary with the people from that tribe belonging to them. It's never used to show lineage with someone who lived in the distant past. So if we go with his logic to say, sister of Aaron, that would mean that Mary and Aaron are contemporaries, that she's living contemporaneously with Aaron. That's how the Quran uses it. That's number one. Number two, Aaron is not a people group. Aaron belongs to a people group called the Levites because they're named after Levi. The group's name is derived from Levi, not Aaron. So you wouldn't say sister of Aaron if you meant her lineage. You would say 
daughter of Levi, meaning if you're referring to her tribe, you wouldn't say she is the sister of Aaron if you're referring to the group, the tribe she belongs to, because Aaron is not a tribe. He's part of a tribe. He belongs to a tribe called Levi. They're named after Levi, the son of Jacob, so it would have been more correct to say daughter of Levi or Mary of Levi, not sister of Aaron. Thirdly, if it's referring to her being a descendant of Aaron, then you don't call her sister of Aaron. You call her the daughter of Aaron, like in Luke 1, 5, if Protestant posted, Elizabeth is not, to, is not said to be one of the sisters of Aaron. It says Elizabeth, one of the daughters of Aaron. You see how wrong this guy is? You see how wrong this guy is? You see how many lies he packed in in less than what? Two, three minutes? You guys understand, right? Because it's going to get worse. Luke 1, 5. Don't be a slowpoke like Biden, sir. You've been cured of Bidenitis, Bidenitis. All right? You know I'm going to have to do the Quran confirms the crucifixion tomorrow, right? There's too much meat in this one for me to pass on. So, guys, that's okay. That means more sessions. All right. So look, Luke 1, 5. There was in the days of Herod, the king of Judea, a certain priest named Zacharias of the course of Abia, and his wife was of the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. No, 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 no. Luke. So you got to learn from Hamza Yusuf. You got to learn from, you know, Ahmad Didad and Jamal Barawi. You should have said she was one of the sisters of Aaron. Luke, don't you know if Elizabeth is an Aaronite, you call her a sister of Aaron? What's wrong with you? How dare you say daughter of Aaron? How dare you say Jesus is the son of Abraham, the son of David of the tribe of Judah? You say Jesus is the brother of Abraham, the brother of David, the brother of Judah. What's wrong with you? And you don't say Abraham, the father of Jesus. You say Abraham, the brother of Jesus. When you're talking about ancestry and lineage, sir... Everyone got it? Okay. Yes, sorry. Exactly, brother. Come on, Buddhist, Buddhist. Can you bring me some Bipsy and Bubcorn? I need some Bubcorn and Bipsy. What is the Bipsy and Bubcorn? All right, let's continue. It's going to get worse. Just I want him to finish his points. Nadran came. Muhammad was kind to them. Let them pray in the masjid. Now watch here how uncomfortable he gets. Because he's got to say it real fast. Loan us the deceit and lie. The Quran, how dare they question my prophecy? No, he treated them with respect. He debated with them. Listen. And, and then when the debate was going nowhere, he 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 challenged them to the mubahala, ah. which they decided not to do after. Did you hear what he said? When the debate was going nowhere, he challenged, Muhammad challenged him to the mubahala. Watch how fast he tries to change the subject. Mubahala. Now we're going to have fun. Guys, please get your bibsy, bubgorn, be prayed up, ask the Holy Spirit to fill us, invite folks. Boy, are you going to be blessed. How easy God has made it to destroy Muhammad because Jesus is alive. He is Lord. Muhammad is dead. And the Bible is God's word. Listen. Uh, consulting with the Jews in Medina. <sighs> said we'll not do that and and they entered into an agreement with him and they moved did you catch it we won't do the mubahala entered in agreement with him this is where i'm going to destroy his lies and expose this liar back and he sent an arbiter with them so okay you caught it right let's stop there let's now burial services he challenged them to mubahala they didn't do it entered in agreement with him Here's what I'm going to now show you from the Muslim sources. Get ready. It's in my articles, and I'm going to give you the links. They're already there in the description box. <clears throat> All from Muslim sources. Number one, do you know why the Christians from Najran, the Najrani Christians, visited Muhammad and Medina? Let me expose this liar, and let me get you the article. Here it is. It's in the description box, guys. It's right here. You go to the description box, and you go here. Muhammad, Muhammad, the antagonizing warmonger. Here it is. 
You know why the Christians of Najran went and visited Muhammad in Medina? Did anyone have an idea? Babsy Babma, man. Give me Babsy. Babsy Babma. Okay, what is the Babsy? I need Babsy. You, you, Bullis, brother. Bullis. Bullis. Anyone know why? Can anyone tell me why the Christians of Najran went and visited Muhammad? Come on, guys. Help me out quickly so we don't belabor the point. Anyone have an idea? Anyone have an idea? Anybody? You know why? Here's what he didn't tell you. No, because Muhammad sent a threat telling the Christians, you better pay jizya or he would come and attack them. Ya Alam Sheikh, Father, Son, Spirit, bless the connection. In Jesus' name. Did you catch it? Here's what he did not tell you. Muhammad sent word, letter to them. He was demanding they pay jizya or he'd attack them. A group of Christians who never posed a challenge or a threat, posed a challenge or a threat to Muhammad, received word, letter from Muhammad, that he was threatening that they better pay jizya or he would come and attack them. So now they're wondering, why is this guy demanding we pay jizya, and they went and visited him. Why did he leave that part out? Why did he leave the fact that these Christians were being threatened by Muhammad, who had done nothing to Muhammad, hadn't heard about Muhammad? And I'm going to quote the sources. That's number one. Number two, did you know that by having the Christians pray in the masjid, the mosque, Muhammad violated the Quran? and committed shirk, associating partners with Allah. <clears throat> Did you know that? <clears throat> in having the Christians pray in his mosque, in his masjid, he was violating the Quran because he knew the Christians worship Jesus as God, and yet he knew that they pray and worship Jesus, and he knew that if he allowed them to pray in the mosque, they would be invoking the name of Jesus, and the Quran says, you cannot invoke the name of anyone else besides Allah in the mosque. Do me a favor, Protestant. Post chapter 72, verse 18 of the Quran. That's the second problem with the story. Second problem with the story. Okay? 72, verse 18 of the Quran, brother. And I'm going to read to you where it says... That he threatened them. Right here in my article, I'm quoting from, it's a long one, we're going to read it. Ahmoud M. Ayu, the Quran and its interpreters, the House of Imran, volume 2, pages 191, 193. Okay? We're going to read it. You're going to see why the Christians of the John came. Now notice chapter 72, verse 18. And the places of worship are only for law. So pray not Unto anyone along with Allah. Okay. Did Muhammad know that the masjids, the masjid, masajid, the mosque, are places where you only serve Allah and call only upon Allah? Yes. Did he not know these Christians serve Jesus and worship Jesus? Yes. The sources say that was one of the debates. Jesus is God. Did he not know that by allowing them to come into his masjid, they would be praying and calling on Jesus? Yes. And did he not know that would violate the command of the Quran? Yes. And he allowed them to do it anyway? Yes, because Muhammad could give a damn about his Quran and his God. His God was a sock puppet. Muhammad would do anything that suited his purpose and accomplish his agenda, such as allowing them to enter into the mosque, pray to Jesus, violating his own Quran, if it helped him, to convert them or get them to pay jizya. He didn't give a damn about his God or his book because his God was a sock puppet. Yeah, rules for thee, but not for me. Now, let me read to you the proof that the Christians of the John came to Muhammad because they were threatened, threatened that he would attack them if they didn't pay jizya. Here it is. Mahmoud M. Ayub, the Quran and its interpreters. And he's not making up. He's quoting the medieval scholars. And this is the House of Imran, 
volume two, pages 191, 193. Are we ready now? Because it's going to get even better when we talk about the Mubahila. We're we going to have fun. Fun under the sun, son. We're going to have fun under the sun, Sammy. You the sexy baby, Sammy. Ooh, you sexy. All right, let's do it. Let's read. Okay, let's read it. Okay, let's begin. Ibn Kathir reports, who is he quoting? Ibn Kathir reports on the authority of Eunice, a Christian who had accepted Islam along and <clears throat> a Christian who had accept, accepted Islam along an interesting account of the Prophet's encounter with the Christians of Najran. The Prophet, <clears throat> we are told, wrote to the Christians of Najran the following letter inviting them to Islam. Why did he leave that detail out? In the name of the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, from Muhammad, the prophet, messenger of God, to the bishop of Najran and the people of Najran, accept Islam, whereas I convey to you the praises of the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I invite you to turn to the worship of God from the worship of his servants. I invite you to accept God rather than his servants as your master. If you refuse my call, then it shall be the jizya of poll tax. If you refuse my call, they'll declare war against you. And the bishop was very troubled by this letter. Why didn't he mention that, guys? Why didn't he mention that? Why didn't he mention that, guys? Can you tell me before I move on? I'm going to let it sink in before we move on. Okay, here it is again, one more time. These Christians of Nadran never posed Muhammad any threat never bothered Muhammad, were just living life and worshiping their Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and they receive a letter from Muhammad, and it says, if you refuse my call, then it shall be the jizya, poll tax. If you refuse my call, I shall declare war against you. The bishop was very troubled by this letter. Okay? Now let's continue reading. He thus sent for a man named Shura... Uh, Shura uh, Shurabul, uh, Shurabul bin Wada for consultation. Can you make your names much more difficult to pronounce, you Arabs? Shurabul was a wise man who was always called upon in times of crisis. After showing him the letter, the bishop asked, What is your advice, O Abu Maryam, father of Mary? Shurabul said, You know well that God promised. Now notice, and they wonder why we assume these stories have been embellished and Fantasy and fables have been added to it. You know well that God promised Abraham a prophet to come from the progeny Ishmael. Really? How does he know that so well? Where? <laughs> it may well be that this man is the promised prophet. I have no opinion on matters of prophet. Had this been a worldly matter, I would have made every effort to give you the best advice. The bishop then sent for a man of Nadran called Abdullah bin Churabbil, known for his wisdom and prudent judgment. But he too had no advice to give. The bishop sent for yet another man of Najran called Jabir bin Fayyid, who also could offer no advice. The bishop finally ordered church bells to be sounded, fires to be kindled, and sackcloth to be displayed in monasteries. When the bells were sounded, all the inhabitants of the valley of Najran gathered together. In the valley, there were 73 towns with 120,000 fighters. The bishop read the letter to them, and it was agreed that the three men, been, three men be sent to Medina to bring back news of the prophet. Guys, now watch what happens. Okay, watch what happens. When the men arrived in Medina, they took up their travel clothes and down rich garments and adorned themselves with gold rings. They entered the mosque of the prophet and greeted him, but he did not return their greeting. They waited in vain to speak to the prophet, but he ignored them. In desperation, they went to Uthman ibn Affan and Abdul Rahman bin Auf, who were their acquaintances. The two companions were sitting with a group of the helpers. 
and immigrants. The three emissaries complained, saying, your prophet wrote a letter. In other words, we wouldn't be here if you didn't write a letter. Your prophet wrote a letter and have come and answered to it. We greeted him, but he would not return our greeting. We tried in vain for a whole day to speak to him, but he would not speak to us. Do you think we should return to our people? Ali suggested that they remove their fine clothes and rings, put their travel clothes back on, and return to the prophet. Look how pious Muhammad is. He won't look at you because the way you're attired. Humble yourself and he'll address you. The man who just threatened to kill them if they don't pay jizya. Oh, yeah, you're very humble, prophet. Okay? This they did, and when again they greeted the prophet, he returned their greeting, slain by him who sent with the truth. They came to me the first time, and the devil Iblis was with them. Yeah, he's with them, but not with you, Muhammad, because you're the son of Satan. But no, it's all right. It's called projecting, narcissist. You project onto others what you're guilty of. It's all right. It's narcissism. If narcissism became a man, his name would be Muhammad, and his counterpart would be Allah. They, bid, they, bid, they debated long with the prophet. They debated long with the prophet, exchanging many questions. At last they asked, watch, what do you say concerning Jesus? We are Christians and we shall return to our people. We'd be glad to hear what you say concerning him since you are a prophet. The prophet answered, I have nothing to say as of today. Remain here until I tell you what my Lord tells me concerning Jesus. Okay, we're going to get to the mumahina and you're going to see why that's important. Before the night was over, God sent down this and the previous two verses. The men, however, refused to send to this view. Thus the prophet came the next day to meet them for the trial of cursing, mubahala, trial of cursing. And I'm going to explain that. But listen what the, who, who was with Muhammad. So Muhammad came out accompanied by Hassan and Hussein, his grandsons, the sons of his daughter Fatima, with Fatima falling behind them. Shurab, Shurabul addressed his two friends saying, you know that the whole valley would not decide without my counsel. By God, I see here a grave matter. By God, if this man is a messenger sent by God, and were we the first among the Arabs to be an obstacle in his way, we would never be spared his anger and the anger of his people until they afflict us with great devastation. Let me share this. Why did they end up paying jizya? They ended up paying jizya because they realized, hey, guys, if we don't pay jizya and he becomes dominant, we will be the object of his hatred and fury because we'll be the first Arabs that rejected to submit to him. And it's going to get bad if this man has the upper hand. So let's save ourselves future trouble by paying him jizya. No, it isn't. It's your connection that's buffering because you suck. You get it? Everyone got it? So why did they say, hey, we're not going to invoke curses on us? We're just going to pay him jizya? Because if we don't pay jizya and he becomes uppermost, he'll unleash his fury more viciously on us because we'll be known as the Arabs that were first to refuse to pay him jizya and submit to him. You caught it? All right. Okay? Now, we are their closest neighbors among the Arabs. If this man is a prophet and were we to challenge him to the child cursing, not a hair or fingernail among us would be spared destruction. His friends asked, what do you propose then, O Abu Maryam? I propose that we let him judge among us, he said. For I see in him a man who would never err in his judgment. And they wonder why we believe these stories are embellished. They agreed, and Shurabbul met the prophet and said to him, I see a better course for us than the Mubahala. You may pass any judgment you wish over us this day and night until morning. Whatever you judge concerning us, that we shall accept. The prophet said, perhaps your people might reproach you for this. There's a typo, guys. I have to correct it. Yeah, I'm sure I remember. Shurabbul said, ask my two companions. They asserted no one among the people of Valley of Nadran would ever oppose Shurabbil's opinion. The prophet thus agreed not to hold the Mubahala. Instead, he dictated the following agreement between him and the Christians of Nadran. Did you catch it? This was Hamza did not mention. They agreed to the agreement. What agreement? Okay. In the name of God, the all-merciful, the compassionate. Okay. Whereas Muhammad has authority over all the properties of Nadran. 
Which person in his right mind would accept that agreement if it wasn't for duress? All our properties are yours and we agree to it. Yet he shall relinquish his control in return for the remission of 2,000 garments every year. Just give me 2,000 garments every year, 1,000 Rajab and 1,000 in Safa. There you go. Why didn't, why didn't Hamza Yusuf mention all this? Why didn't Hamza Yusuf mention all this? Everyone got it? Do you see what he left out? Okay. Hamza Yusuf failed to tell you, Muhammad wrote a letter telling the Christian Najran, who never bothered Muhammad, never threatened Muhammad, could care less about Muhammad, who are living their daily lives, worshiping Jesus, and a letter shows up out of nowhere saying, you better become Muslim or pay jizya or I'll declare war against you, troubling them, messing up their lives, changing the course of their lives <clears throat> afterwards, forcing them to have to meet him and agree that our property is yours, but you'll give us our property in exchange for 2,000 garments. You got it? Now let's talk about the Mubahila. And boy, you're going to love it. Mubahila. Remember it said... Muhammad brought out, Muhammad brought out Fatima, Hassan and Hussein, and Ali. Hassan and Hussein, here doesn't say Ali, but Ali is there. Another riwayat. Who Ali, his son-in-law, first cousin, Fatima, Muhammad's daughter, Ali's wife, and their two sons, Hassan and Hussein. What is the Mubahila? Let's go to 361. Post 361, Protestant believer. Boy, guys, we have fun. We're going to have fun. All right, we're gonna have fun. Watch here, folks. We're just beginning. Get your bibsy popcorn, okay? Okay. <clears throat> Three sixty-one, and whoso disputeth with thee concerning him, after the knowledge of which have come unto thee, say unto him. Watch here. Say unto him. If they're gonna argue with you, this is what you say. Watch here. Watch what an evil son of the devil this man is. Come, we will summon our sons and your sons and our women and your women and ourselves and yourselves. Then we will pray humbly to our Lord and solemn, solemnly invoke the curse of Allah upon those who lie. That's the mubahila. This is where you tell Allah, Oh Allah, if I'm lying about you, damn me, curse me, my women folk, my wives and my children. But if they're lying, damn them, curse them, their wives and children. Who came out? Muhammad, Ali, Fatima, Hassan Hussein. Here's where this proves Muhammad is of the devil. Because Jesus took his own words and used his own words to expose he's a son of the devil. Why? All four people die painful, shameful disgraceful, humiliating deaths. Muhammad was poisoned by a Jewish woman when she fed him the left shoulder of a poisoned lamb and he died in the most miserable conditions to the point that he told Aisha, I feel like my aorta is being cut off. Number two, his daughter Fatima got attacked by Umar in her house and he threatened to burn her house. And due to that attack, it says that she lost her baby, had a miscarriage. And due to the complications, she ended up dying. So she died six months after Muhammad. Number three, Ali ibn Abu Talib was murdered. And his caliphate was opposed by Muawiyah ibn Abu Sufyan. Number four, Hussein, Ali's son, was murdered at Karbala, which they celebrate to this day if they're Shia. Okay? Number five, Hassan, Ali's son, was poisoned. And to this day, the Muslims don't know who poisoned him. Was it Muawiyah? Was it Yazid? Was it his wife who was paid off by Muawiyah to poison Hassan? All the people who are part of the cursing, 
got cursed and were damned and died a shameful, humiliating death. Coincidence? It's all in the description box, folks. I gave you the links to all these sources from Shia sources, Sunni sources, secular sources, and Shia quoting Sunni sources to confirm it. Here, let's see what happened to Muhammad. Here we go. Let's check it out, okay? Let's go here. Okay, watch here. Here it is. This comes from Sa'id Bukhari, Volume 5, Book 59, Hadith 713, Book 64, Military Expe Expe Expeditions Led by the Prophet, al maghazi Chapter 83, The Sickness of the Prophet and His Death. Here's the link, sunnah.com. Here's the link. Okay. Here it is, guys. There's the link. Let me read what it says. Narrated Aisha, the prophet in his ailment in which he died, used to say, Oh, Aisha, I still feel the pain caused by the food I ate at Khaybar. And at the same time, I feel as if my aorta is being cut from that poison. Died a humiliating, disgraceful, shameful death. And even died the death of the accursed and damned. Because in chapter 69, verses 44 to 47, specifically chapter 69, verses 44 to 46, there it says, if Muhammad were to invent sayings and attribute Allah, Allah would take him by the right hand and cut off his light vein, his aorta. And here Muhammad says, my aorta is being cut off. Now, how is it that Muhammad is dying, the death of an accursed Satan, in fulfillment of the Quran. Does that mean the Quran is God's word? No. Let me tell you what it means. The real God, Jesus Christ, took Muhammad's own criterion. Because Muhammad said, if he's a false prophet, then God would cut off his aorta. And Muhammad invoked curses on the liars. So Jesus, being the true God, said, you know what? I'm going to kill you the way your satanic book says you would die if you're a fake prophet. In order to give sign to the Muslims... That even according to your book, you're an antichrist, a son of the devil, burning in hell. Jesus killed him that way to show people that even according to your own criterion, Muhammad is a false prophet. And how do I know Jesus did it? Because Jesus says he has the power over death and the underworld. Revelation 1, 17, 18, Protestant believer. Revelation 1, 17, 18. Who controls death? Jesus. So watch what Jesus does. Using Muhammad's own words to prove to Muslims, your prophet is of the devil burning in hell because he died the death of an accursed false prophet. You see how amazing Jesus is? And how do I know, how do I know Jesus has power over death? Revelation 1, 17, 18. Bidenitis is kicking in. He gives me 17 and puts Revelation 1, 1. <laughs> Revelation 1, 17, 18. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead, and he laid his right hand upon me, saying unto me, Fear not, I am the first and last. I am he that liveth and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And I have the keys of hell and of death. Hell and death are in my hands, under my control. I have the keys. I control them. I was going to mention Ahmadidat next. Now, how did Fatima die? Here it is from the article. Here it is. There you go. It's all in the description box, guys. I link to all these articles, description box. Please, those of you who come afterwards, check the description box and the comment section. Let's read what Omar did to Fatima when Ali refused to give the pledge, Bayya, to Abu Bakr. Ali did not want to give his pledge to Abu Bakr to be the caliph. Let's read History of Al-Tabari, Volume 9, page 187. Ibn Humayr, Jarir, Mughayra, Ziyad bin Kulayb, Umar ibn al-Khattab, Amr ibn al-Khattab, came to the house of Ali. Talha and Zubair and some of the immigrants were also in the house. Umar cried out, by God, Wallahi, either you come out to render the oath of allegiance or I will set the house on fire. Umar, a companion of Muhammad, Threatened to burn Ali's house down with Ali in it 
and Muhammad's daughter in it and their children, right? And Zubair came out with his sword drawn as he stumbled upon something. The sword fell from his hand, so they jumped over him and seized him. Okay? That's one. Let's, let me read a few more. Let's see how they treated Ali and Fatima. Two of the five that were there invoking the curse. Two of the five that were there invoking the curse. This comes from Musnaf of Imam Ibn Abi Shayba, volume 7, page 432, hadith number 37045. 37045. Watch. Narrated Muhammad bin Basha from Ubaidullah, from, uh, from uh, Ubaidullah bin Amar, from Zayd bin Aslam, that his father Aslam said, when the homage Bayya went to Abu Bakr after the Messenger of Allah, Ali and Zubair were entering into the house of Fatima to consult her and revise their issue. So when Omar came to know about that, he went to Fatima and said, O oh daughter of Messenger of Allah, no one is dearest to us more than your father, and no one dearest to us after your father than you. I swear by Allah, if these people gather in your house, then nothing will prevent me from giving order to burn the house and those who are inside. Catch it? Now watch. This comes from Qira. في قطوب الأقائد by Farhan Hassan al-Maliki, page 52. Watch this. However, Ali's party was smaller in number during the reign of Omar than the reign of Abu Bakr al-Siddiq due to his abandoning Ali on account of his breaking into Fatima's home during Abu Bakr's reign and forcing some Sahaba that were with Ali to give bayah to Abu Bakr. Thus, the memory, the memory of this dispute that is proven by authentic chains, authentic chains, were deemed a painful memory which they did not like to recollect. See, they didn't want to talk about Omar breaking into the home, <clears throat> attacking Fatima, causing their miscarry, and dying and due to the complications, dying as a result of it. So she only lived six months more than her prophet. She died, her father, he, she died six months later, threatening to burn the home, threatening to burn the home. Okay, you got it? This is Islam, folks. Muhammad's own companions fighting each other, killing each other, slandering each other. Okay? This is all in authentic Sunni sources as well as Shia sources. This is a fact. So, what's my point? What's my point? Five people invoked Allah's curse on them. Five people invoked Allah's curse on them. Okay? Five. All five of them died a painful, humiliating, disgraceful death. What about Hassan? That was Fatima. We gave Fatima. Okay, one second. Let me see if I let me read another one for the sake of time. All right. Let me see. Should I? Well, no, I think that's enough. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, that's enough. I read enough. Let me now show you what happened to Hassan. Here it is. This is from IslamWeb.net. Islamweb.net. Yeah, that's what we're talking about, Orthodox Shahada. We're talking about the property of uh, Fada, uh, Fada, Fadat that they, well, no, I'm sorry. Am I, no, no, I apologize. Yeah, well, this is part of the story. I'm sorry, Orthodox Shahada. This is also part of the story. I'm talking about Umar threatening to burn the house of Fatima when they were in it because Ali refused to give his allegiance, Bayya, to Abu Bakr, but also the property for that which they robbed Ali and Fatima of. Yes, that too. I didn't mention it. I apologize, brother. Too many issues to come up with, but Lord willing, I'll probably do a session on it. Lord willing. But here now, Islamweb.net. Islamweb.net. How did Hassan, how did Hassan bin Ali die? Hussein, everyone knows, he was killed at Karbala. He was set up. Ambush and was killed, right? And then his head was chopped off. That's in the Sunni sources and the Shia sources. Why do you think they celebrate Karbala? You know, Karbala, right? Okay, now let me read this. You guys with me so far? This is Muhammad invoking curse that fell on him. Like the psalmist says, may the curses of those who curse me fall on their head, O God. May the curses of those who curse me fall on their head. Right? Giving you the gist of what the Bible says in regards to those who curse you will fall on them. Now, let's read what it says. Okay, here it is. The question is being asked. 
How did Al Hassan bin Ali? How did Hassan bin Ali die? Was he martyred in a war, or did he die a natural death? Answer. Okay. It has been reported that Al Hassan died a poisoning. The scholars held different views regarding who poisoned him. Some said it was done by Muawiyah, the very man who opposed Ali starting up a, ri a rival caliphate. Others said it was Yazid ibn Muawiyah, and others said that it was his wife. And still others say that his wife was paid off to murder Hassan. However, none of these accounts are authentically proven true. Now, what he means is not that he wasn't poisoned. That we know he was poisoned. He died of poison. But we do not know for certain who poisoned him. Was it Muawiyah? Was it Yazid? Was it his wife? We don't know. We don't know, but these are the stories, but we do know he was poisoned. Now, I don't need to read the rest of it, but you get the idea, right? Hussein Hassan died humiliating, shameful deaths, the grandsons of Muhammad. One poisoned, the other murdered. Ali ibn Abu Talib, oppressed, attacked, opposed by Omar ibn al-Khattab, Abu Bakr, Muawiyah ibn Abu Sufyan, that even when he became the third caliph, I'm sorry, the fourth caliph, because Uthman was the third and he too was murdered, Muawiyah opposed his caliphate and became a caliph of his own, and the two went to war, and Ali eventually was murdered. Fatima, due to Omar breaking down the door, causing her injury, miscarried, and she died due to the complications, and she only lived six months after the death of her father, and Muhammad died due to poison. Is it a coincidence the five figures that Muhammad invoked curses on if they're lying all die disgraceful, shameful, humiliating deaths? Coincidence? Everyone got it before I move on? Because now I'm going to give you a modern example. I'm going to give you a modern example. Ahmad Didat. People don't know this. Ahmad Didat in his debate with Anish Arosh, a wicked, filthy, vile convert to Islam named Ahmed Thompson. When he introduced Ahmad Didat, got up and invoked the Mubahila on the liars. Let me play it. Let me play it for you. On the liars. Here it is, preserved for perpetuity. Okay, here it goes. The debate is Jesus God from a Muslim channel. And here it is. We're going to start at the 14 minute, 48 second mark. Ahmed Thompson, a British convert to Islam, as he's introducing Dida, invokes the Mubahira 361. Allah cursed the liars because he's wicked and filthy like his prophet. That's all they do is curse you if they can't murder you and rape your women. Watch here. This is the religion, folks. And watch what happens. What the true God, the God of Anis, our God, the Father, Holy Spirit, did to Didat and his son, Yusuf. Just briefly introduce Mr. Didat to us all. Thank you. Rob Christian, here it is, brother. Good evening. Start at the 14 minute, 48 second mark. Mr. Ahmed Didat is probably well known to many of you already. He's been in England several times before and was here at the Albert Hall in July and then last summer in another similar debate to this. He's the director of the Islamic Propagation Center in Durban in South Africa. And he's a man who has studied both the Quran and the Bible for a considerable length of time. Obviously, as a Muslim, he accepts the Quran is the final revelation from God to man, to the last of the prophets. And much of his perspective is based on what is in the Quran. He is also interested in the Bible, though, which although it does not contain the original gospel of Jesus in the original Aramaic, is nevertheless still an interesting document. And perhaps we should just draw your attention to one of the verses of Quran. Listen. Which says, Listen. and the science is addressed primarily to the Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings of Allah on him, but also to all Muslims. 
And it says, if anyone disputes with you. He just quoted 361, Mubahala. If anyone disputes with you, notice he's invoking curse. This wicked son of the devil, like his prophet, invoking curse on Ani Shirosh. Because he thinks he has the truth and Shirosh doesn't. After the knowledge which has come to you, this is the knowledge in the Quran. Then say to them, bring your sons and your women folk and yourselves and ourselves together. And let us pray to Allah, let us pray to God. May the curse of God be on us if we are lying. So on behalf of Mr. Didat and of all the Muslims, I would just like to say that as far as the knowledge which he refers to from the Quran, may the curse of Allah be on us if it May the curse of Allah be on us. Which is not true. If it's not true. Thank you. Did you catch it? Now, which Muslim is not going to say that the true God fulfilled that curse because Didat became a vegetable. 1996 to 2005. God struck Didat down like a vegetable. Sorry, Tony Costa. I know you want to be politically correct, my brother. Because supposedly Tony Costa says, he rebukes any Christian who says that this was judgment on Didat. Keep your opinion to yourself, brother. You're wrong. And the Lord have mercy on you. From 1996 to 2005, Didat became a vegetable. God struck that man where he couldn't move his hands or feet or talk. All he can do was open his mouth and wink his eyes. Left him in a miserable, disgraceful, humiliating condition for all, nearly 10 years. But that's not the end of it. How many of you are aware that a few years ago, do go to Google, D. Dot's son, who was a sweetheart, who was nothing like his father, a sweetheart. I was actually sad to hear this. Yusuf D. Dot was shot in the head, point blank, murdered in South Africa. Yusuf D. Dot's son. Yusuf D. Dot's son. And if you meet him, he was not like his father. I don't rejoice in this. So you Mohammedans, you wicked liars, don't say I'm rejoicing. I was saddened because I've seen interviews and he was not like his father. He seemed to be a sweet, humble man. Didat became a vegetable because Jesus muzzled him and allowed him to remain in that miserable, pitiful condition for almost 10 years where he couldn't move, couldn't raise his hands, move his feet, speak. All he can do is wink his eyes. <laughs> learning the fear of Jesus Christ because now he's under the feet of Jesus I pray he repented before he died but his son Yusuf Didat got shot someone came up to him, shot him in the head and he died, he was murdered guys don't take my word for it go to Google type in Yusuf Didat murder it didn't happen not uh, it happened not too long ago. Now, would a Muslim now say that that curse that this convert to Islam invoked, the true God heard, and that this proves Didat is a liar, Muhammad is a liar, because the curses of God fell on them? Muhammad died a humiliating death. Fatima died due to <clears throat> oppression and tyranny. Ali died because he was murdered and oppressed. At the hands of fellow Muslims. In fact, Ali went to war with Aisha, the Battle of the Camel, a war that Aisha instigated. This is the fruit of Islam. Muhammad's own companions and family members attacking, killing, murdering, slandering one another. This is the rotten fruit of this man, Muhammad. Hussein murdered at Karbala, Hassan, Ali's son, poisoned, and they don't know. Did his wife poison him? Did Muawiyah poison him? Or Muawiyah have his wife poison him? Or Yazid? But they do know he was poisoned. Every single person involved in the curse died a humiliating death. Muhammad, Fatima, Ali, Hassan, Hussein, and now Ahmad Didat and his son. What more proof do you want, Muslims? Jesus, the God of Muhammad, to destroy Muhammad, took Muhammad's own curse and his own criterion and brought it upon him as an irrefutable sign to all of you your Muhammad is an antichrist, son of the devil, under my feet. The Bible is my word. I am God, your only hope of salvation. Repent and turn to me because I love you and I want to save you. Okay? Amazing stuff or what?
Okay, I like what JP once said. Looked like the Game of Thrones episode. Amazing stuff or what? Right? See these Muhammad ambassadors? They're playing with my kids. If this guy was a man, he'd contact me and try to do jihad on me. But what are you going to do? See? Report this guy again. But this is what it is. Because he's still upset his mother is a Shia whore who was violated like Muhammad was violated by Satan, his father. If these, these men were only men and told me where to meet me to try to kill me, please, guys, can you do jihad and kill me? Contact me, tell me where to meet you, and kill me for Allah and his messenger. But you're not as much as a man as your mothers are because they were really bold men when they went to Iran and allowed those 10,000 Shia to do muta with them, fathering you bastards. You play with my daughters, you know, then I have to protect them, self-defense. But anyway... And guys, they don't know that I have someone who knows how to get the IP address. This is why I'm clicking on their YouTube channels, and I got the links right here. I'm going to pass it on, and we'll see what will happen from there. So keep it up, guys. Keep trying to use my daughters, the God of my daughters, our God, the Father, Son, and Spirit, the Lord Jesus who lives, the God of Sarai and Zipporah, our God, deal with you for even messing with my daughters, Lord Jesus, arise for them, not me. For them, you protect them, Lord. They are yours in Jesus' name. Now watch what's going to happen to you, the same thing that happened to your mother. But anyway, now with that said, guys, coming back to the issue. More clips, and I hope you enjoyed this session. I'm going to have to do another session on the Quran Confirms the Crucifixion because this is already too long, but that's okay. That will give me another opportunity to do another session sometime, Lord willing, tonight or tomorrow. Because after this, I'm going to go walk some more, burn some of this cake that I ate so I don't become fat and ugly like Sargon D or Rob Christian. But guys, everyone, that tells you they hate that we're destroying Muhammad. They are miserable. We're burying Muhammad, that filth in their Quran, and there's not a damn thing they can do about it, but simply cuss us out, insult our families, and slander us. And the more they do that, the more they prove we're doing the right thing. So they're actually giving us incentive they're showing us we're on the right track because if they love me, that means I'm doing something wrong. If they praise me like they praise James White or Samuel Green, then I know I'm on the wrong side. Glory to Jesus that when they manifest like spiritual whores like their mothers, they're proving I'm doing something right and may the Lord Jesus be glorified. <laughs> Woo! Bring me Bibsy, Bibsy. Can you bring me some Babgur, Bulis? Can I have Bibsy? What is the Bibsy, Bulis? All right. Last clips. We're done. Here, let me let me show that clip of D dot. Hold on. Let me show that clip of D dot. Where he's a vegetable. All right. Let's see. Let's see. Horrible death. Watch here. Let's see here. Here it is. Watch his face. Here goes. Watch his face here. Muhammad or God. This is a clip. Ahmad Didat, horrific end, YouTube. Posted December 7, 2012. Karian C. Okay. And he posts John 3 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believed in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Now, folks, I'm going to put this in the description box and pin it as a comment. Watch his face. Watch his face. Go look what God did to him for nearly 10 years, 1996 to 2005. 1 John 2, 22, he's posting verses. Who is a liar, but he that denieth that Jesus is the Christ? He is antichrist, that denieth the Father and the Son. Verse 23, whosoever denieth the Son, the same hath not the Father, but he that acknowledgeth the Son hath the Father also. Okay, now watch. Go watch the clip. I just shared the link. Lord willing, next time I'll do StreamYard and we'll show it, but I'm giving you the link. Watch it. <laughs> I want and to keep going. Go watch his face. Go look at his face. Okay. He's like, they show him, he's like this, and he started to cry. And he can't make a noise. He can't lift a finger. He can't move his legs. All he can do is. That's what you get when you blaspheme Jesus with your mouth, your hands and feet. 
The living God will teach you the fear of the Lord Jesus and make you a vegetable. There you go. Matthew 26, 28. For this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. Listen to him. And then it quotes Surah 4157, denying the crucifixion, showing you the contrast. Here's the link. Right. Second Peter 2 1. But there will there were false prophets also among the people, Second Peter 2 1, even as there shall be false teachers among you who previously secretly shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them and bring swift destruction on them. Watch his face, they're showing his face. He's like, Go watch his face. Looks demonic. Demonic. Okay, Mark 1 11. And there came a voice from heaven saying, Thou art my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And then quote chapter 9, verse 3, saying that Jesus is not the son of Allah, Allah fight you. And then he shows you the dots, finality. Go watch the image. He's got it. The clip. He's in the bed. That's all he can do. Can't move. I feel bad for a son, not him. I feel bad for a son that he got murdered. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, that shall he also reap. And then he quotes Revelation 20, 10. And the devil that deceived them was cast in lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are, and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. And there you go. That's it. So we got it, guys. You get it, and you get the point. So that's the terrible end of the dot when that stupid Ahmed Thompson invoked the curse of Allah. Not that Allah is God, Jesus is God, and he took Muhammad's own statements that if he's a false prophet, this is what happened to him. And Jesus then killed him the exact way that Muhammad said he would die if he's a false prophet as proof Muhammad is the son of the devil. Praise the Lord Jesus Christ. So now let's end it with these few clips because I want you to hear it from the horse's mouth. What does he say about abrogation? Because some people tell you, those verses that preach tolerance, peaceful coexistence were abrogated later on when Muhammad left Mecca for Medina and had the upper hand. Hamza Yusuf says, no, that's not true. But here's why. And he confirms what I've been saying for a while. We're going to start at the 38 minute, eight second mark. The 38 minute, eight second mark. Listen to what he says. And I've been saying this, by the way. Okay. 38 minute, 38 second mark. Watch here. Listen to this, guys, because a lot of Christians think, a lot of Christians think that the passages in Mecca where Muhammad was outnumbered and he taught peaceful coexistence and turned the other cheek were then canceled out when Muhammad went to Medina and became uppermost and had the upper hand by the verses in Medina saying, now fight them, kill them, subjugate them. Yes and no. They were abrogated for Muhammad but not for all Muslims at all time. Now, I need you to learn. And here, Hamza Yusuf is going to confirm what I've said. He's going to confirm what I've said. I have said those verses in Mecca where Muhammad taught, turn the other cheek, your religion, to you, know, to you your religion, to me, my religion. You know, tolerate one another. Were abrogated for him when he went to Medina and became uppermost and had the upper hand but not abrogated for all times why because when muslims find themselves in the same pre predicament that muhammad found himself in mecca those verses are applicable let me repeat what makes islam more dangerous and hamza yusuf is going to confirm it please listen and learn christians learn when muslims find themselves in an area where they're outnumbered by the kuffar, the unbelievers, and they have the upper hand, and they have the resources, and they have the army, and they have the government under their control. Then the Meccan verses that were applicable for Muhammad when he was surrounded by the unbelievers, and they were a minority, will be applicable. Will be applicable. So if Muslims are like Muhammad in Mecca, then they follow the Meccan verses. But when Muslims, like Muhammad, become uppermost, increase in number, have the upper hand, 
have enough military prowess and resources, then those verses are abrogated for them. Everyone got it? Do you understand how it works? Do you understand how it works? If you are living at a time where you're outnumbered by the kufar, the unbelievers, they have the military, the resources, the government, you then apply the Meccan verses because you're now in the same situation Muhammad was when he was in Mecca. But if you then have enough numbers and have a strong military base and you have enough resources to mount an attack, then you go to the Medinan period. So the Muslims in the West, they're in their Meccan period. The Muslims in Saudi Arabia, they're in the Medinan period where Muhammad was overlord. The Muslims in the UK, they're in the beginning stages of the Medinan period because at the beginning, Muhammad now became head of state, but he still did not have enough resources or manpower to attack Mecca and subjugate it. But he could then still impose his rule to some extent. That's why in the UK, there are certain quarters of the UK and England, the Muslims have taken over. You can't infiltrate. And if you try to dare come in, they'll attack you. They're in the beginning stages of the Medinan period, like Muhammad. And when they have enough Muslims in the UK, they will then implement the final stage of Muhammad's Medinan period, where now he has enough military prowess, enough resources to now subjugate Me Mecca, Medina, and the surrounding Arab Arabian tribes. You got it, guys? That's Islam. And here it is from Hamza Yusuf's mouth. Here it is from his mouth. And so the Prophet ﷺ, during this persecution, they first went to the Najashi. And one of the things that I think Muslims forget Listen. is that we have three sunan, three sunan from our Prophet. The sunnah of powerlessness, which is the sunnah of Mecca. Sunnah of sunnah powerlessness. But the Muslims act as if... He's admitting to you Islam is of the devil because it uses trickery, connivery, deceit, deception. There are three sunnans of Muhammad. When you are powerless, that's Mecca. Do you hear it? It's from the horse's mouth. Now listen to what he says again. During this persecution, they first went to the Najashi. And one of the things that I think Muslims forget is that we have three sunnan from our prophet. The sunnah of powerlessness which is the sunnah of Mecca. And this sunnah is not abrogated, but the Muslims act as if it's been abrogated. Act as if it's been abrogated. He's, man, this man is a blessing to us to expose him in his religion. That stage of powerlessness won't be abrogated because you may be in that stage of powerlessness. So it's applicable to you, though Muslims act as if it's abrogated. And which Muslims do? Not the ones in the West, those who own the lands like Saudi Arabia, Iran. If you say that it's abrogated, that means his 13 years in Mecca have no real meaning. Like all that suffering he went through, all that patience, all those things don't really have any, any meaning to us anymore. They're just a historical fact. So that sunnah is, is just has no meaning to us. That's basically what people are saying when they say that the Meccan period is over. The Meccan period is never over. Meccan period is never or over. Save this video, guys. Upload it. They may flag you for it. Someone try to make a clip. Hamza Yusuf, a Western Muslim scholar living in California who started Zaytuna Institute, the first accredited Muslim college in Berkeley, California. I like to see him lobby for a Christian college in Saudi Arabia and Christian churches if he's a man. He just said the Meccan period is never over. Did you hear it? Guys, are you hearing it? This should be music to your ears. The Meccan period's over. The Meccan period's never over. If the conditions in which the Meccan period uh, occurred return, then the same Sunnah of Mecca returns. If the conditions of the Meccan period return, the same sunnah returns from the horse's mouth. Jared, all the links are in the description box, but here it is. Did you guys hear it?
Finally, what does he say about ice and how can we determine whether ice, ISO is sure or not? 23 minute, 35 second mark. We're done, folks. I hope you got a meat fest. Lord, and I'll be back for more. If God gives me the health and the protection, and my daughter's health and protection to glorify Lord and the support. Here it is. 23 minute, 35 second mark. We're done. I enjoyed exposing this guy. Oh, man. I forgot to do Mary. Lord willing, I'm going to have to do a part two on this tomorrow with the Quran crucifixion. Don't forget tomorrow I'll do Mary because it's already long. Instead of, of a healing, seeing it as an obstacle instead of the remover of obstacles. So he, you know, in thinking about this revival of thematude and... Listen. Uh, sexual slavery, concubinage, and these things that, for instance, Graham Wood in his article using Bernard Heichel as a foundation argues that these Muslims that think that ISIS isn't following their religion. So this man, Graham, says that Muslims think ISIS is not following their religion. So what does Graham say? And notice some says the response. They just have a distorted version of their religion. And this is basically Graham Wood's argument in that Atlantic Monthly article. See what he's saying? Graham Wood is saying those Muslims who think ISIS doesn't represent Islam, they have a distorted view of Islam. They don't know real Islam. So Hamza Yusuf is upset by that, that this man would say that. Now notice his response. That what they were doing or what they're doing in Syria and Iraq is actually from Islam. It's not an anomaly. They're just practicing things that Muslim haven't been practicing for a thousand years. You better believe it. Graham Wood is right. ISIL is not doing something that's an anomaly. They're simply doing what Muhammad and his followers did, but which Muslims haven't been doing for, all, for a while. Graham Wood is right. Now, how is he going to respond? And... People like Glenn Beck, who's written Glenn a book Beck. recently, it's number three, last time I looked, number three bestseller on the New York Times bestseller list called The Problem Is Islam. You better believe it. Argues that there are many, many good Muslims, but they're not good because they're Muslim. They're good because they're not practicing Islam. He's absolutely right. Graham Wood, Glenn Beck, and this was done in 2016, this talk, but it was just uploaded recently on this channel. The problem is Islam? Exactly. A good Muslim is a Muslim who doesn't practice Islam. Thank the Lord Jesus. Right. And so we're getting large numbers of people being indoctrinated into this idea somehow that our religion is a, a death cult. And arguably a death cult has emerged within our religion. Do you see? He ends up refuting himself. He goes that people are being indoctrinated. Yeah, we're the ones indoctrinating people by quoting your sources that Islam is a death cult. And then he just admit, arguably a death cult has arisen from our religion. Has arisen from our religion. So where are we wrong? Where are we wrong? This whole idea, you know, a shahadatu ghayatuna, this slogan that martyrdom is our goal. That's, that's not the goal of Muslims. He's lying. That's not, that, that's not the goal. The Prophet said, He said, also don't ask for death. And the same Muhammad said, there is no greater deed than jihad. And he's not just talking about, you know, different types of jihad, like if you die of an illness or you fall off your horse. He's talking about jihad that's military. No greater deed. And Muhammad himself said, he would love to be killed in jihad, resurrected to be killed in jihad, and resurrected and to be killed in jihad over and over again. Because there's no greater reward than doing jihad for Allah. So why do you quote one part of what Muhammad said and ignore the other part? And you call us cherry pickers? Right. So there you go. Now, Lord willing, I have to do a part two, and I'll include the Quran and its view of the crucifixion, because I got to destroy his lie about Mary being an Aaronite. Lord willing, I'll do that because you got over two hours. We still had a good crowd. We had about close to 260. Glory to God. Pray the numbers increase. Pray the numbers increase for all these channels, for Rock Christian and everyone else. More people watching, more people learning, more people studying, more people proclaiming. So that said, Lord willing, in part two, I will refute his lie that Mary is an Aaronite. She's from the line of Aaron. The Bible destroys that lie. Christian tradition destroys that lie. And Islamic tradition destroys that lie. 
The links are all in the description box, guys. When you come later, you'll see in the description box, and I'll link them as a comment, pin them as a comment. And Lord willing, in part two, I'll go more thoroughly in refuting that and showing what the Quran says about the crucifixion. Guys, do pray for me. Even though my daughters are not here, I'm going to celebrate my cheat day, have cake and ice cream in isolation because my daughter's not here, but it's her birthday, the oldest one. Pray that God will grant my daughters, even their mother and me, miraculous, divine, physical safety and protection. Ask the Lord if he tarries to grant my daughters perfect health and give me the power of perfect self-control to stay healthy, to stay fit, that even on that cheat day, I don't go crazy, I don't get away, keep it off, that my heart, my lungs, my chest and throat will be optimal so I can use my health to glorify the Lord and be there for my daughters for strict self-discipline. Pray my daughters fall in love with Jesus. I fall in love with Jesus more and more and become like Jesus more and more and never shame the Lord or fail the Lord that the Holy Spirit will seal all of us to be in love with Jesus. Please pray these prayers if you really believe the Lord is using me in your life. Pray for my channel, for my blogs, for the articles and YouTube <clears throat> sessions to go viral so more people can get educated. Take my materials, upload them, translate them, make clip, clips out of them. But please ask the Holy Spirit to help you understand perfectly all that you heard. Do not misunderstand so you don't miscommunicate. May God save us from error and sin, confusion, stammering, and give us the power to know and live and apply all these facts for the glory of Jesus. And pray the Lord will bring in steady support because it's getting hard. People are panicking. But pray the support remains steady. So I can take care of my daughters for the glory of Jesus until the Lord summons me in his presence or until he returns. May the blood of the lamb cleanse all of us, even your loved ones, my daughters, their mother, purified in the blood of Jesus. May the Lord Jesus fill us with his spirit, fill our loved ones, my daughters, with his spirit and give us the power to truly love him and enjoy him and delight his heart and never fail him. And may he return sooner than later to judge the living and the dead. Lord Jesus, use us to glorify you. <clears throat> In the name of the Father, and of the Son, of the Holy Spirit. Father, have mercy. Son of God, have mercy. Holy Spirit, have mercy. <clears throat> May you return, O Son of God. We love you. <clears throat> Maranatha, Christ is risen, risen indeed. Take care.